Matt, would you put the mic in the hole? For all the people in the U.S. to thank those who fought in war or helped the U.S. during war. Veterans Day means a lot to me. I like to know that the men and women who served are being thanked for what they have done for the country. Veterans Day is also important because it is a time to celebrate our country and the veterans who fought for it. Every time this day comes, I think of the U.S. history and what it would be like if the veterans didn't help. The world is a better place now with the veterans who helped. My father's cousin, Andrew Lee, joined the Marines in March 1995. A book was written about his platoon experience in Paris Island. Andrew is still active with the Marines. He served in Iraq throughout the entire war. It was his platoon that Hold down the statue of Saddam Hussein in Baghdad. He is still an active Marine today and travels to Africa to help train their military. Thank you, veterans, for serving our country and keeping us safe in the U.S. Thank you for making sacrifices for our country. I am thankful that USA has a good military that is fearless and willing to make sacrifices to keep us safe. Thank you for your courage and making peace in the world. Thank you for giving us freedom and for being brave, caring, fearless, selfless, and most importantly, a U.S. troop. Thank you. Now, Brianna. Dear veteran, Veterans Day is an amazingly important holiday here in the USA. I am so thankful for the men and women who risked their lives to save ours. I can barely explain it. It really means a lot to me. I know that I am completely safe in my home and the world I live in because of you. Without you, we wouldn't have freedom, safety, liberty, peace, protection, and last but certainly not least, our American flag. My dad was a Marine. He was a helicopter mechanic. In 1997, in the Persian Gulf, my dad was based on a Navy ship. Due to the constant threat from Iraq and Iran, the aircrafts usually flew at night. One night, they launched several helicopters on a mission. All of a sudden, a hydraulic hose bursts in one of the helicopters shortly after takeoff. The misting oil eventually got sucked into the engine and set a massive fire in the back of the aircraft. Unable to control the flames, it became necessary for the pilot to be forced to ditch the helicopter into the water. Despite the desperate attempt to return to the ship, they set it into the cold midnight ocean. The pilot held it steady while the crew and passengers jumped into the water for safety. Then, like a boat, he rowed it through the waves away from the others. The captain then rolled it into the water and the rotor blades crashed and splintered everywhere. The helicopter rolled upside down and quickly disappeared under the waves. The helicopter was estimated to have sunk about 20 feet before the pilot was able to release his belts and escape the sinking aircraft. He was recognized with a flying cross for his bravery and selfless actions, saving all the Marines on board. Thank you to all veterans so much for your help. You are remarkable people. Thank you for sacrificing your own life to save the USA and the people who live in it. I am honored to celebrate this holiday. I am very proud of all of you. And once again, thank you for serving our country. You are my hero. Thank you, Aiden and Brianna. You're both inspirations to us, and we agree that it is because of our veterans that uh, we have the freedom we do. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. A plus.
<laughs> I'll turn it back to you. Okay. Um, so we will approve tonight's agenda. I have <coughs> no changes. Ms. Sheridan? I wondered if we could have a moment of silence in honor and memory of Diane Glassline, principal, former principal of the um, Tucker School. Sure. Who passed away suddenly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any changes to the agenda? Approved as submitted. Uh, Superintendent's uh, citizen speak. Do we have anyone for citizen speak? We don't have a secretary, so I'm the secretary. Montgomery. I How think are you? Okay, I think you're all familiar, but please introduce yourselves sure. and uh, state um, your name and address. I'm Heather Montgomery. I live in East Milton Square at Ten Church Place. Jane Green, 96 Granite Place. Margie Skier, 95 Granite Place. Carrie Kelly, 54 Belcher Circle. Rose Rhodes, 28 Belcher. I just wanted to thank all uh, the school committee members that we got a chance to meet with and talk to over the last couple of weeks. Um, as, as we've discussed, you know, um, that um, we believe that uh, the residents of East Milton Square deserve a discounted rate due to the danger of crossing over 93. Um, when the buses in East Milton Square went from being free to the rate of $210 back in 2007, uh, we were given a discounted rate by the administration because they believed it was too dangerous for children to cross over. Um, I understand there's other intersections in Milton that are also da dangerous, and I can relate to that. Um, but I don't think that should therefore mean that we don't receive our discounted rate simply because there's other Continued. dangerous and <coughs> continued, continued discounted rate. That's right. Um, they, I wish they would be here with us and we would fight for them to get a discount. Can you rate. just hold the microphone because we really can't hear you. Sorry. Is that better? Or just pick Maybe it up and hold it. it up. Yeah. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I cross over it, as I mentioned before, four times a day with my, with my four-year-old son and my dog. I, if it was safer, I would walk with my two daughters as well. That's why I would have three children and a dog. And it's too dangerous to do that, to walk my children to school. Um, they run the red lights all the time, at the, especially at the post office. Um, I ran into a postal worker the other day that said he is almost hit all the time because he has to cross to get to work. He said he's thrown his keys at cars. He's thrown rocks at cars for almost hitting him. Um, there was a road rage incident the other day when I met with uh, Leroy and Mike right before. Um, I mean, I could go on and on about instances that I've had. Um, so it's, it's honestly not safe. It's an entrance ramp and an exit ramp for a freeway. That's what it is that we're crossing over. And over the next two years, it's going to be in flux with construction of a parking lot that will also have entrances and exits coming from that. And Safety is not something they've taken into consideration in the construction of that whole project. So that's why we believe we deserve to continue to have our discounted rate of $225. I don't know, Cindy, anything else? Um, also, as a public health professional, I wanted to weigh in on the fact that um, you know, we never want a financial issue to become a public health issue and a public safety issue. And when small children are crossing dangerous intersections and we as adults feel unsafe, and I know, you know, my small six-year-old walking across the street, cars can't see. Um, and so we don't want this to become a really public health and safety issue because if one child gets hurt as a result of this, then this is on all of us, and we would hate for that to happen. So 
um, we do believe that this is truly a, a safety issue, and we hope that um, we can stand together on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I'd like to invite to the table the Tucker Site Council. And Dr. Elaine McNeil Jamai, I'm going to ask you uh, to make the introductions. Welcome. Good evening. Can you hear me well? Yes. Okay. All right. So hopefully our PowerPoint will come up in a moment. Um, but thank you for having us. We're the Tucker School Site Council. Uh, we do not have all of our members here this evening, um, but we have all had an opportunity to look at, review, and analyze the school improvement plan that we're submitting for 2014 to 2017. Um, so it is a representative presentation. So I'll actually just pass the mic down just for each member to share uh, a welcome. I'm Kirsten Driscoll, a third grade teacher at Tucker. Elizabeth Spitz, kindergarten teacher at Tucker. Uh, Carrie McHugh, parent of a fifth grader and a second grader. Uh, Oliver Trog, parent of a third grader at Tucker. Steve Paxia, a parent of a fifth grader at Tucker. Terry Shields, parent of a fifth grader, a third grader, and a kindergartner next year. Would it be okay if we stole one of these to keep one stationary? Um, so this evening, what we hope to do is review a few uh, briefly our Tucker School 2014 MCAS data, review our Tucker School Improvement Plan and the process that we went to to determine the goals and strategies, as well as our review of the advancement initiatives at Tucker School, and then share a little bit with you about uh, celebrating success and the Tucker experience. Um, so looking at our 2014 MCAS data, what we've done is we've actually put up the comparison for you from 2011 to 2014. 2014 is highlighted for you in yellow. And when we analyzed this, we had a few data observations we wanted to share. Um, so in looking at third grade, what we saw is that although the proficiency levels were lower this year, um, we did see that there was a gap between our high needs and our non-high needs subgroup. Um, that decreased significantly from 55% to 43%. And in math, our, the gap between the subgroups also remained constant. So while we did see that our overall scores went down, we did notice that we are decreasing some of those gaps between students. We also noticed in looking at our data that last year was also a high for us in third grade. So while, again, we had a dip this year, it actually remained pretty consistent with our previous year's data. Um, in fourth grade, we saw a slight increase in our ELA scores from the previous year, um, although this particular cohort had decreased from the year before, from 69% to 48%. Um, but we have noticed in looking at the data over time that there is a consistent decrease for students as they move from third to fourth grade, um, which we think is relevant to notice. Um, in grade four math, we actually saw a really great improvement, a significant increase from 2011 to 2013 scores with students at 73% advanced and proficient. Um, so we were very pleased with that for our fourth grade math. <coughs> in grade five ELA, there was a significant decrease in the um, percent of students in advanced proficient compared to 2013. But if you look at the grade four cohort, there was an increase from 46% to 68%. And then in grade five math, there was also a decrease in the percent of students in advanced proficient compared to 2013. But again, there was an increase in the cohort from grade four to grade five, from 51% to 
Uh, moving on to student growth percentile, uh, you'll notice that we had very strong growth in all areas except for fourth grade ELA. Um, again, we think that has a little bit to do with it being the first test that students are asked to do writing on. Uh, and one of the things we're looking at at site council is how to support writing in the school uh, beginning in third grade, or beginning actually all grades, but um, with an emphasis towards, towards third, fourth, and fifth graders being able to do well on uh, park writing exams. Um, so last year at the site council, we did some, some initiatives around literacy, and we're going to be looking at similar things around writing. Um, but other than that, we see very strong growth in our students. So our Tucker School Improvement <coughs> Plan, these are the five criteria we're looking to improve or continue to improve. High academic achievement for all <coughs> students, excellence in the classroom, a collaborative relationships and communication, respect for human differences, risk-taking and innovation for education. And the determining goals and strategies that we use to get to these goals, um, the Tucker faculty and staff took a survey in June, and we had reflection and discussion about these topics in September. So this is a collaborative project, not um, all teachers, staff, faculty, all agree on these criteria. Uh, we have an internal and external data collection and analysis where the teachers sit down and look at the data and we have our next teaching strategy, strategies through this data. We have analysis of intervention outcomes. So the students that need intervention, they're in for six weeks within push-in and then we look at the outcomes. Do they need more intervention or should we do another tactic with them? We have analysis of progress and resources from advancement initiatives. We have an analysis of continued focus items from 2013 to 2014 <coughs> school committee presentation. Our school is currently doing the RTI program, and this year we're really pushing in instead of pulling out. Um, our kindergarten has one day a week push in, and in January we'll be doing small groups within the classroom with our Title I uh, support staff. Grades one and two have a collaborative group with Title I in math and in reading four times a week. <coughs> Our grade three has a, a mode in math in ELA. And our grade four has an RTI model with math and writing blocks with the supported Title I team. Our grade five has two ELA blocks and two math blocks per week supported with our Title I. I would just add to that that the Lane Sheridan has a question. I just have one question. Sure. Sorry. Can you explain what the eighty to eighty five percent under tier one and ten to fifteen percent tier two and five to ten under tier sure. two? Sure. So this is um a typical RTI model for making sure that all students are met. Um so tier one being the core curriculum, so the majority of students will be able to access the curriculum in the classroom just through traditional classroom instruction. And then when we look at kind of tier two, the next 10 to 15 percent are students that may need a little bit of intervention, which is the Title I support we have. And I was going to add also um, through the advancement initiative, the early uh, literacy focus, the reading specialists that are across the district. So those are kind of supports that are coming in at tier two to support students. Tier three would tend to be uh, in more intensive intervention, so that would be when we were looking at students who um, would be identified as special education needs. So not all students receive the core classroom instruction? They would all receive that, and then this would kind of be, the, really when we're thinking about this, it's thinking about at what point they're able to access the content. Okay. So they would all receive that core, okay. and then if they weren't able to access it with just those classroom supports, moving into some intervention, and then moving into some identified so individual 80, plans. 80 to 85 percent of the students in the classes right. can access the curriculum, right. the and core that's, curriculum, without right. any intervention. Right, and this is actually just, this isn't uh, Tucker alone, this is a typical um, percentage for an RTI model. So this is, you know, when they look at that data, tech, um, generally 85 percent of students in any given student population will be able to access it in the classroom. 
Right, so we're going to move into the goals. Um, what we wanted to do, I know that you hear many school improvement plans, um, and I'm sure that as a district, we're obviously working very closely on our strategies and our goals. Um, so what we wanted to do was highlight um, the strategies we felt were particular to Tucker or were new or refined this year. Um, but if you have any questions on ones that we don't go over, we're happy to review those as well. Hello. <clears throat> uh, last year when we came to see you, we were telling you how proud we were that Tucker had become a level one school. And today we're here to tell you that we're a little disappointed that Tucker fell to a level two school. And uh, we want you to know that the parents, the teachers, the principal, everyone is very, very determined to get back to a level one school this year. And you will see in all of in our plan, as you look at it, we believe in accountability. And accountability in every plan goal that we have, everything, you will see quantitative and qualitative measures that the teachers, the principal, and the parents, and the students will work on throughout the year. So that at the end of the year, there's a real accountability as to how we're doing, how we're succeeding, and how we're going to improve in this next year. So we, we just all want you to know that this is something that every person in the Tucker community is taking very, very seriously. So the first goal is um, that we're going to work to increase the number of students scoring in the proficient and advanced category on the state assessment in all subgroups to 75% or higher. We're also working to make sure that every student within the median growth student percentile in the MCAST and the PARC assessment continue to improve. And we will be working on de uh, decreasing the gap between internal data assessments throughout the academic year, targeting instruction around uh, identified academic needs. So looking at data as it applies to every single student and trying to make sure that we're using the data to make uh, better instruction and better results in a measurable way. Are you gonna do yeah. So we have a number of strategies uh, that we're implementing or continuing to implement to help us reach that first goal. So we're going to continue to make sure that students, um, teachers, and families all know and own the data. So this data is not just grades three through five, but really K, one, two, all the way through their schooling. We're going to make sure that students receive rigorous instruction uh, using high quality hands-on common core aligned science curriculum, which we now have with our FOSS units um, from Bernadette, our science coordinator. We're gonna, uh, a new strategy we have is that we're gonna implement some district determined measures in math, and we're looking into some programs to use to find those district determined measures, and one of those is a Silicon Valley um, math program that I can get into further, but it's really like, writing about math and thinking deeply about math, which is an area that we thought we needed more focus on this year. We will make sure that we have additional learning opportunities beyond the bell. Uh, some of these programs we've already started this year. So for third grade, we've started a Saturday Academy, which we've opened up to the entire third grade. Um, it's an hour of math instruction, an hour of ELA instruction, a 15 minute snack, and then 45 minutes of an enrichment. So we have 30 students that have signed up, um, which is like half the third grade, who've been coming every Saturday. And it's been a really great program uh, to be a part of. We're also going to be sure to continue to do um, some before school sessions. We're going to tailor these around fourth and fifth graders as they get closer to the park testing dates. So these will be two three-week sessions that the students will attend for four days in the week. Two of those days will be ELA focused and two of those days will be math focused. Um, and they'll be the three weeks leading up to the park assessments. So we'll determine eligibility based on um, their <coughs> MCAS data from last year and the internal assessments we're giving throughout this year. Um, we're also starting a mentor program at Tucker. So we've looked at the DOE website and determined some high risk students and their fourth and fifth graders that there will be about six students assigned to a mentor, which is also a program that we've started already. Um, this will consist of homework help or meetings throughout the week, um, teachers really working with students closely to help fill in those gaps and 
make them feel safe in the Tucker community and a part of the Tucker community and help them with their academics as well. Um, we're also going to continue to develop a collection of clear exemplars and rubrics in all content areas. And we're going to work on a scope and sequence of technology skills identified through K through 5. So we've been working with Sarah Doherty this year and we've refined our technology blocks so that every class meets with her every other week and we're working to build off those skills K through 5. Um, yeah. Goal number two, uh, we will be working towards 100% of our students reading at grade level uh, by the end of grade three and all students K to 5 able to read and respond to texts across the curriculum as measured by internal assessments and park MCAS assessments. So I, I think I look at the goal and I, I think a little bit about what does that mean? There's a lot of, there's a lot of words to read. <laughs> um, and overall, I think as it's been explained to me and as I understand it, it's ensuring that not only are the kids reading and reading above grade level, but that they're also analyzing text, getting into text, getting excited about writing and reading um, that's not just rote or basic, but is things that they really care about and believe in. And so I'll talk a little bit about what some of the strategies are here, but I think you'll see them interweaved throughout the entire presentation. Um, as at Tucker, particularly this year, I've seen a new um, quest to make sure that the kids really are thinking more, not just about their ability to read, but also what are they reading and writing about it. So a couple of these uh, items will be things I'm sure you'll hear from every site council sitting up here for the rest of the year because they're the same. Um, full implementation K through five of readers and writers workshops. That's not something new. I think it's something we're all familiar with. Um, targeted reading instruction for students reading below grade level uh, K through three. One of the new items is the pilot district wide kindergarten readiness program. We are very excited that that program is actually going to start at Tucker. Um, for those of you who don't have a lot of information about it, um, it uh, focuses on early literacy, bringing in kids pre-kindergarten, um, social and school readiness uh, skills, everything from having a backpack and knowing what it means to go to school every day, um, not every day, but a, a few days, um, and then really trying to connect families early on that might not otherwise feel as connected to the school. Uh, <clears throat> another one that is district-wide is students exposed to text on or above their reading level. Another new strategy is identifying predictive reading assessments. Uh, again, this is ensuring not just that they are, uh, we're looking at whether or not they could read the text and understand the text, but could they analyze the text? Um, and in thinking about this, I was amazed how many times Elaine and actually all the speakers have used the word analyze um, since sitting here. It really is such a core skill um, that I do feel like we're now beginning to look at more. And this um, assessment really does look not just at can they read, but um, can they analyze and understand the text? Um, last, uh, students are provided multiple opportunities to respond in a variety of writing forms on paper and when utilizing technology. Uh, one of the best examples of this, I think, uh, you were saying earlier, Liz, is uh, you actually, you kind of slipped by, but you said writing about math. The kids are now coming home, both my second grader and my fifth grader, and they're having to write about math, not a sentence, not how did you come to this, but true paragraphs to articulate an understanding of a math um, concept. And so not only does that help with the math, but it certainly helps with the analysis and the articulation, um, which is something that I think we, um, that the kids have been struggling with. Uh, with that, did I miss anything, Elaine? Mm -hmm. She missed a vocation. She did great. Tucker is a true di diverse school community, and uh, it's a real asset that it, that it is as diverse as it is. And diverse learners uh, with a range of, of learning needs, um, diverse uh, racial and economic backgrounds, uh, and as a, a parent at Tucker, uh, this is truly a, something that makes the school very special and, and very unique and a, a rich opportunity for us. Um, therefore, it's a priority at Tucker that uh, we have the school culture and we have the learning environment um, in which each child, regardless of, of need, regardless of obstacle, regardless of background, uh, is able to learn and able to achieve. And um, in order to make that happen, um, we really stress and emphasize that uh, each member of the community 
um, adult and, and, and children um, are welcomed, are engaged, um, and that um, each child, each adult feels that they are valued, that they are heard, uh, that they are contributing to that community, um, that they have something to offer to that community, and that also that they are learning and that they are becoming um, a better person and becoming the best person that they can be both academically and otherwise. Um, so therefore, our, our goal number three um, is written to, to reflect uh, that diverse community. Um, goal three is that Tucker School will develop a community of respect, collaboration, and achievement amongst all stakeholders, students, teachers, families, and community to ensure the optimal learning environment for student success. And there are a number of strategies that we have in place in order to make that happen. Our new strategy is that our faculty will engage in internal learning walks throughout the school year. Um, today we already had a learning walk and Kirsten was nice enough to open up her classroom and do a reader's workshop lesson and had teachers in there analyzing and looking at what she does and helping her with her instruction. Um, I actually did a learning walk for um, the principal of Glover School today and um, we did a model lesson for the SEI program for the administrators. So the students are learning that the teachers are learning and the, the students are showing how much they know and they rise to the occasion when adults are in the classroom. Strategy 3.2 is there are multiple modes will be utilized to maintain communication between school and home. Um, Dr. McNeil Gramai is often emailing parents, calling parents, doing all calls. We uh, Teachers update parents monthly and weekly. We're in constant communication through email, through our headline pages, and our PTO is kind enough to call every Sunday with an update for teachers and parents. Uh, our refined strategy we have, are all students will engage in lessons, discussions, and activities that will enforce a bully-free zone at Tucker School. We're actually taking um, a kind school initiative in January to go along with the, our bullying blitz. Uh, the kind school initiative is for students to learn just the uh, certain criteria to be kind, hold the door for someone, smile at someone, say good morning. And these are you know, things that you learn every day, but if we model this behavior, um, the school morale will go up and everyone will see, be a little bit happier. And it's shown that test scores actually go up when kids are happier. So hopefully this will work. Uh, refine, refine strategy 3.4, a collaboration with the PTO, Site Council, and Diversity Committee on school-wide themes, academic areas of focus, and initiatives to ensure students feel pride in their achievement, efforts, and culture. The Diversity Committee is currently working on a cookbook for Tucker School in which families are submitting recipes um, that they really enjoy at <coughs> home and that we're going to put this book together. A refined strategy 3.5. To expand the Tucker Reads project to include more families and faculty members at Tucker School as well as an additional Tucker Writes focus. Um, this Tucker Reads program was amazing last year. I had kindergartners actually go on to view me, so they met me through the Tucker Reads program before they even laid eyes on me in person. And this helped with our communication and they felt ease on day one. So hopefully by now you've noticed that this is a passionate group of a, of a site council. We're very active, not just in meetings, but on the playground, picking up kids, talking to the teachers, uh, talking to the students. It's a very involved group. Uh, lots of us milling around uh, with all the students and other parents after school every day. Um, but in the site council meetings, uh, we're actually, we worked with Elaine uh, and her group on the the school improvement plan. We spent a lot of time working and editing the plan and giving our input, and we think it's a really very good plan. Um, you know, we will be along with uh, the teachers and the students and everyone looking at the data as the year progresses every single month, holding, looking at this plan, looking at the benchmarks in this plan, and making sure that the progress in this plan is happening on the schedule that we're hoping for. We're going to continue to expand the Tucker Reads program, and uh, we are looking for some uh, new volunteers this year. Uh, 
I do notice a few people over there who were not readers last year. So uh, Elaine and the, the, the site council will be calling some of you. So pick your favorite book. And then uh, uh, we'll also be uh, redoing uh, the pep rally that we did before the MCAS last year. Uh, we got very good feedback on the pep rally. I think Leroy was among us that day. And uh, it had, we think it had the effect of desensitizing the students to the exam and making them feel it was more of a challenge than a threat. So we think that the students went into um, the MCAS with a good attitude. Um, let's see, Ms. Terry. A few additional strategies um, for next steps for the site council. First of all, we're, we're going to be very proactive and very intentional in how we welcome new families, both uh, incoming kindergarten families and new families coming with a student uh, in, in non-kindergarten uh, classes. And again, this is, uh, can be a very stressful time for families coming in. And uh, as the Tucker School community, uh, we really want to go um, above and beyond helping ease that transition and knowing uh, that they are part of, of the school community and uh, helping both the, the family and, and the child make that, that transition. Um, so we have had uh, opportunities for them to come together and um, people up, up here and other uh, parents that have been there to, to greet them. And also we've had our fifth grade students uh, do some outreach and, and be able to welcome our kindergartners and, and incoming students as well. Um, we'll have a school-wide publishing party for um, a, one thing that uh, Tucker does incredibly well is celebrate the achievements of our students uh, on numerous occasions, um, both in the character and, and academically. Um, a new thing this year is that we're going to be celebrating uh, their writing through a school-wide publishing event um, in which uh, some of the, uh, every child will have a, a chance to share uh, some of their written work um, and especially some of the more exemplary work uh, will be uh, noted and, and, uh, and celebrated and, and had a chance for the entire school community to hear that, that written work um, and for students to share that. And then finally, uh, we'll have the start of the Tucker Writes Project, which is not only going to encourage uh, writing uh, and to help students be um, better writers, um, but one way of doing that is, is allowing students peer-to-peer -to, -peer to critique work and to really um, very critically and honestly w work and challenge one another to be, to be better writers. And I know that that, um, whether it be in writing or, or reading, um, uh, that type of uh, peer interaction is so important to helping students be better, um, and in this case, better writers. Um, so just to share some of the highlights, um, as we've shared uh, as a council and as a faculty, we've really been looking closely at our data and we know that where we put our efforts, we're seeing you know, the dividends pay off in student growth and student progress. Um, so in really looking at our data, we found that writing, well, I should back up a step and say that you know, literacy was identified as an area to focus on last year. We put a lot of energy into the early literacy initiative with this Tucker Reads program, with the support in the classrooms, looking at our data closely uh, with Superintendent Gormley. And we saw a lot of progress there. And so, you know, that continued into this year. We're already seeing some highlights. So we're seeing now uh, in grade two in our English um, uh, innovation classrooms, 82% of our students are already reading on grade level. 85% um, of our French immersion second graders are already reading on grade level. Um, and in grade three, looking at that data, we see that 80% of our students are reading already at grade level. So that work is paying off. We want to continue that work, and we're confident that we can get that to 100% this year um, with a smaller focus of our students. So moving into the next piece, again, we've now identified that writing is a big focus we need to look at. Um, when we looked particularly at our grade four ELA scores last year, uh, we saw that for many of our students, the area of concern was writing. And as we're transitioning to PARC from MCAS, um, where in the past, as Oliver said, grade four was that one opportunity for writing. Now it's grades three to eight. There'll be writing opportunities in both the PBA and the end of year. So we really need to focus um, K to five on writing to make sure students are prepared. And one of the pieces that we need to look at as a school is really kind of how to scaffold that. Um, I've shared with the teachers, and you may have seen online, the, all of the writing forms that they say 
um, may be on park. And it's a full page of all of these different writing opportunities. And at some point, we'll really need to kind of think about K-5, what that will look like. But for this year, what we've done in grades three to five is we've looked at that and we've identified what are the um, writing areas that are already covered in our readers' workshop, in our writers' workshop, and then we're building in opportunities to make sure we get to all those other writing forms. We want to celebrate writing at our school, and we want to increase writing in math, in science, in all of the content areas so students are prepared to explain their thinking um, in a variety of forms. So again, we have students writing across the content K to five. Um, as Kirsten mentioned, we look closely at our third grade data as well. And we, we felt, you know, last year when we looked at our internal data for third grade, that it wasn't uh, that far off from the district. But yet, when we took the MCAS, we saw that the advanced and proficient levels were not there. So we're really trying to think about what is the piece that's missing in grade three. And so one thing we identified was let's have more opportunity for learning. Let's try to do um, more critical thinking opportunities. So we are, again, extending that learning beyond the bell. Uh, we offered the Saturday Academy to the entire grade, all students, and we had a great response. Um, and we are going into week four, and the students come. They do not know it's Saturday, apparently. They're very excited, <laughs> ready to learn, much more awake uh, than the adults that are teaching them. Um, but it's been really great. And what's nice is we actually, the 30 we have, we have um, 10 from each of our program strands. And so students that aren't necessarily generally working together are getting the opportunity to get to know one another um, in the classroom, but also doing fun things in terms of enrichment. You know, the first week it was a beautiful Saturday and all the family stayed outside and played. And these are generally not students that have been playing together. So there's a lot of um, positives there academically and socially. Um, and our community circles are again in full swing. Uh, we had one today that was the first round of awards for our students. Um, so again, recognizing their success, making them feel that school is a safe place and a place where they want to excel and succeed. And we hope to do that uh, through those opportunities and through things like mentoring this year. More highlights. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I'm really excited about this because I'm on the kindergarten team, but there is a kindergarten readiness pi pilot that's going on at Tucker right now, and we're already in week three. We have a phenomenal teacher, Mrs. McGrory, who has been uh, an aide in our kindergarten, so she knows exactly the students we're looking for, what they need to know coming in. Um, the students are excited to come. They're playing, they're cutting, they're learning their alphabet skills, they're carrying their own backpacks, which are great skills to have before you come down into really scary real world kindergarten. But it's a great pilot program and um, we're really excited for what's going on. It's really small and there's uh, eight students right now and Mrs. McGrory in an age. So they're getting basically four, four to one, which is great. Uh, we have a grade four and five mentoring program that we began on November 5th, and this is great for students that need that extra adult in their life, an extra adult to say, wow, you're doing a great job. Wow, do you need some help with your homework tonight? Or um, do you have, you have a test tomorrow? Do you need a little prep in the morning? Maybe we can meet at eight o'clock and make sure you have a really strong breakfast and you're ready for that test. Uh, we're continuing the Planting More Project partnership, and we received a Community Builders Award in October. And um, year two will begin in 2015. The Planting More Project, if you haven't heard, um, the kindergarten team, along with Ivy Anthony, planted um, beautiful gardens that produced more food than I've ever seen. And the food was donated to the Milton Food Pantry all summer to families in need. Uh, this is a great program for the students to learn about science, but also learn to give back to your community. We actually took a field trip to the Milton Food Pantry and saw where the food is kept. It was a wonderful experience for everybody, adults included. Uh, we have a collaboration with the MECA for the KRP and Story Walk. And we, have a, we had a successful second annual book character day that was held on Halloween. Most students were dressed up and all faculty was dressed up. It was a really exciting day at Tucker School. So I got the looking ahead, which is the fun stuff. Um, we have a wide variety of uh, storytellers coming in this year. Um, I, I think they were Tibetan monks, is that true? Or they will be? 
coming. Um, I know that I think yesterday, the uh, today, yesterday, yesterday, last week, I don't know, somewhere, <laughs> we were definitely talking about it at home. The Mexican wood carvers came to tell their story, um, and then Len Cobral will also be coming. It sounds like a little thing to kind of sit and listen to a story, but it's about a much bigger theme <coughs> around everybody having a story and learning how to articulate your story and your beliefs uh, and your passion. I think um, sometimes Elaine calls it the grit, um, finding yours kind of within. Uh, College-bound <coughs> focus and monthly community circle continues. Uh, <coughs> class chants are coming soon, which um, I'm sure we'll all delight in at home. Uh, the monthly principal tea and PTO evenings um, with uh, visiting and guest speakers, Elaine is actually going to be leading off this one, talking about park, but also uh, nutritionists will be coming and talking um, to parents, as well as uh, two librarians who will be talking about what resources you can find at the library for yourself. Really, this is to help bring more parents into the school uh, in an attempt to offer topics that parents will be interested in um, and kind of get them, uh, get everybody more involved in the community. Uh, I think we talked about the Tucker recipe book. Um, which I assure you will all be purchasing. Um, and there's some also some great things that happened at Tucker. They happened last year and will be happening again. The Spelling Bee, uh, which is one of my favorite events. The Girls STEM Club. Um, and the Planting More Partnership. And then this year we'll also be doing the One Book, One School, The Day the Crayon Quit, where everybody will be reading the same book. Um, and I'd add to that, uh, that's kind of one example of it, but I'm looking at my uh, fifth grader and actually my second grader, and there's a lot more book clubs going on at the school. Um, they really did start in the classroom, uh, small groups who were picking uh, books and reading them together, but what we've discovered is it's coming way outside the classroom. I have a child who is 99% uh, of the time will be found playing soccer, however, he seems to be fitting time in to talk to his buddies about what they're reading and passing books home um, on a regular basis. So there's really a lot of excitement going on around reading and talking about reading uh, in places that you wouldn't normally see it. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Is he going to get the light? And a little credit, that's our, one of our fifth graders did this piece of artwork last year of Tucker School. So wanted to end on a positive artistic note. He's getting <laughs> it. He's getting it. Yeah. Well, thank you. Questions? Ms. Padera? I just have so many, but I'm going to have to hold back because it's just so <laughs> exciting to have you guys here as usual. Um, so the it seems to be happening in all the elementary schools that you know jump to grade four, and you've said it's you think it's mostly the the writing um, portion of that. Is there anything else going on there that you know we need to kind of tackle because it does seem very consistent, and it almost seems consistent um, in other areas as well. So. Um, any other insight on that? Because we seem to hear it every year. Um, I really, I mean, in looking at our data, I really feel like for us it was definitely writing. Okay. Um, but it will be really interesting to see what happens with Park because it's not just going to be in fourth grade anymore. Um, and so they'll be able to measure that progress and growth in a more meaningful way, hopefully. Okay. So, and that brings me up to my next question. In terms of Park coming up, how do you think things will be different and how are you prepared to deal with those differences for next year? Sure. Well, I think um, the two main differences are just uh, in the way that the test will be given, so the technology piece. Um, and I think uh, shifting how we worked with Sarah Doherty this year. So <laughs> last year, uh, sh what she would do is work with certain grades for kind of longer periods of time focused on a unit of study. Um, and we'd kind of rotate through so they would see her more intensely but for a shorter period of time. Mm -hmm. So we really felt like this year we needed a clearer scope and sequence K to 5 that would be the entire school year. So we could really kind of start to build a vertical alignment of technology skills. Um, and one piece of that is the typing without tears. So, you know, starting early with the students, helping them learn to type mm -hmm. so that they'll be prepared. I think the, the one of the big things we took from the pilot last year with our grade four students uh, that piloted where they knew with writing that if you were given, you know, a writing prompt, you write and you review and you revise. Mm -hmm. 
with the uh, park pilot, they would write about two sentences and done. And there wasn't that same kind of connection to this is what I do on paper and this is what I do on the screen. Mm -hmm. So really working with them to understand that they have to plan their writing regardless of how they're going to present it. So that's some of the work that we're doing this year. Um, and then I think the time factor will also be a big one. Um, it's, it's a little hard to say we actually had more than enough time last year. Um, so nobody ran out of time. Yeah. But, you know, when we have the full long assessment. So, you know, they're in addition to the work they're doing um, with Sarah Doherty, uh, we also have the Study Island assessment, with, which, not assessment, but program, which actually looks a lot like PARC, and it has some of the similar features. Um, so just making sure students feel comfortable with that so that that will, won't be a piece that holds them up time-wise. And just piggyback on that, can you tell us who Sarah Doherty is you keep referencing her? Oh, back? sorry. The people so, at home don't. Sure, so, so our instructional technology teacher. So she works with all of the students alongside the teachers um, in the computer labs or in classrooms using technology. Do you want to? And that was a position uh, from the school committee and the town in Advancement 1.0. One individual for four elementary schools. Yes. Excellent. And then just one last question, if I can. Um, well, two. I have two things to say, really. The, um, the National Spelling Bee, is that just, do you have that at Tucker? We did last year, um, and I think, I think it was just us and Pierce yeah. last year. So what we did is, uh, as a whole school around the winter break, all the students had the opportunity to study the words, and then we did class spelling bees across the school. And the top two students from each class were invited to a free spelling bee club for four weeks to prepare um, to be in a real spelling bee. And then we did a, uh, students in grades one through five, actually. So we did a grade one through five spelling bee. Their families were invited in. And we had one fourth grader last year, Stella, uh, who did go to the state spelling bee championship. So I will say this year when I registered us, it did say that as of now, Massachusetts doesn't have a state location for a state spelling bee. Mm -hmm. So, but apparently Mary's going to make a Milton. So, <laughs> so that, that's the only glitch this year. And I was like, but um, our goal is to send another student to the state spelling bee this year. Yeah, I just think it would be a great, since you've done it in the past, even hosting and inviting the other schools would be a great opportunity to bring Absolutely. some schools over, some other kids over to Tucker and kind of yeah. mix, do some mixing. And then the last thing I wanted to say is that, you know, I see you have the book character day and all the faculty um, dressed up. And I know that Mr. Zulis in particular likes to dress up for Halloween. <laughs> I know. I also do, but he's even better at it. So you might want to think about inviting him next year because he's really, he's got some good costumes. Well, that is true. I did not recognize him at the monster. <laughs> um, but yes, and you know, it, it's funny, we, we do it on Halloween, but the students get so caught up in the books. Yeah. It was really, you know, exciting to see them like, well, this is my character, and they all have to bring their book, and they do book buddies together. Um, and so it's just a great way to get them talking about books instead of about costumes. I was going to say, it's a great way of having them share about their favorite books and favorite mm -hmm. characters with in a creative way. They have to be kind of creative about it and and that excitement of, you know, people find, you know, guessing who you are or you mm -hmm. having to tell them and I think that's just a fantastic way of bringing that to life. So, great job. Thank you. One thing I'd comment on about uh, Elaine in particular, <laughs> um, not your costume, but... Um, I was Amelia Bedelia. She was Amelia Bedelia. <laughs> oh, perfect. She, she rocked it. Um, is we're talking about a lot of stuff and we talk about kind of the objective and why we're doing it and character day is a good one. Like Elaine talks about it as this very serious thing. And you would think that that might get lost on the kids or the spelling bee is another great example. They work beautifully. My, yeah. The kids are talking about their characters. They're talking about their books. They're talking about spelling. It's not a, it's not a lane kind of driven, and kind of trickles out. Uh, somehow, your enthusiasm for these activities is infectious to your teachers, and your teachers are infectious to the students. So I would just want to add that I feel like we talk a lot, and we talk about a lot of bullets, and we say we do this, this and that. Um, they really are, some of these activities really do become central to how the kids are learning in the classroom and how they're interacting with each other. So I would just, I'd put in that ad for both the spelling bee and the character day. I'd like to add a piece of uh, backseat buzz, as I call it. Uh, frequently, a lot of us are running around with three or four kids in the backseat of the car. 
And Becky, on your thing about writing, yeah. uh, the, the buzz really comes when they start doing collaborative online uh, writing, you know, with a group of people critiquing each other's writing. And they've had, I think, two or three of those so far. And that elevates the writing from drudgery to fun. Yeah. And the big difference is, and you know, I, I grew up without word processors. I'm that old. Uh, but I used to hate to write uh, because revising was so horrible when you were using pen and paper or typewriters with whiteout. Uh, but with, with these wonderful tools we have, uh, being able to use a computer and being able to easily edit and revise and change takes a lot of the, the drudgery out of writing and makes it more fun to be creative. Mm -hmm. And so I would say, just listening to the kids that I listen to, that the more we could do to accelerate the use of the many devices we have for that kind of projects would really help get a lot more enthusiastic writing going across the school system. I, I, I agree. And it's also the handwriting aspect of it, too. Some, I have a student who's got some very messy handwriting, and it's painful. And I think, you know, it's also it's somewhat developmental in terms of the strength that some kids get earlier than others. So it, it can be a real great tool in terms of being able to write clearly so you can, and, and slowing yourself down to think as you write as well. So I, I agree with that. Mr. Zulus? <clears throat> I, should, uh, I should probably speak next. Um, my official position is that I have no idea who may have dressed up as the superintendent. <laughs> <laughs> But I would observe that I would, um, I would suggest to no one that they try to run a 5K in a skirt. <laughs> um, I have two questions. Uh, well, while we're on that, my, my advice is one and done. <laughs> um, uh, advice taken. Um, uh, first question is, um, I tried to go through your presentation and uh, discern whether there was other, any, any um, additional funding required for the new strategies and the new initiatives, and I couldn't quite make it. So, I, so the question is, is there any, are there any of the items that you identified as a new strategy or, or as an old strategy that will require uh, additional funding for the coming, uh, for the next mm -hmm. fiscal year? Um, so the kindergarten readiness pilot, so that was from um, the advancement initiative last year under early literacy. Mm -hmm. So for looking to continue or expand that into next year, that would be one area. Um, and I would love to see that be a half day program. So we're running it right now, two hours, um, two times a week. So we're doing 10 week sessions. So students will get 40 hours of kindergarten readiness. Um, if they stay with us through all three sessions, they would be 120, but which is not a huge amount, but 40 hours if you're not in any program is a, is a good chunk of time. Um, but we would love to see that expand to a half-day program for students. And that's for, for three to five-year-olds? <coughs> um, well, our ideal was to have four-year-olds so that they'd be coming into uh, kindergarten next year. We did accept, I believe, two three-year-olds that were just turning four. And um, if I might? No, you go ahead. I interrupted you. Um, I was just going to say, most of the Beyond the Bell um, activities, the mentoring and the Saturday Academy, that is coming out of Title I funding. Mm -hmm. um, so I would just say the only other pieces that may require future funding um, within the School Improvement Plan um, was our science curriculum. So we have the new curriculum for grades three to five. Um, at Tucker, we were lucky enough to get a Blue Hills Bank grant last year, so we were able to buy the kindergarten FOSS kits, but grades one and two do not have those, and I know as a district, K-2 does not have an updated science curriculum. Um, and in terms of math, um, we have a curriculum in place, um, but it's not the most updated version, which is the most common core aligned version. So I, I don't think a new version is needed. From what I understand, I think we just need to get like the resources that uh, make it fully Common Core aligned. 
So if you want to stay um, until 10 o'clock, you can do the advancement 3.0 with us. <laughs> um, you did an outstanding job, which demonstrates where the ideas come from. And I would add one more idea all through this presentation you heard about writing and the emphasis on writing and the readers, uh, writer's workshop, the professional development, uh, the text materials and supplies. And after Finance Subcommittee left today and we met with our elementary coordinators, um, the Tucker Initiative, because of the PTO, in Title I funds the uh, classroom, the, the book rooms, and the classroom libraries are the furthest ahead of all the elementary schools. But that is a huge, you, if you would speak, because from the source, um, is valuable for us the value of those book rooms and those leveled readers in every room from the people in the classrooms? Well, we're lucky enough that we were able to get reading levels for all of our students because we've been able to see how important it is that they're reading books that are at their independent reading level. Um, so last year with the early literacy initiative, they took the time to use those reading specialists to really um, administer assessments to every student so that when they even came into third grade day one I had a reading level uh, for every student so I knew the right books to be putting in their hands and then just being able to have the resources to give those kids books um, I would say this year kids in my class have read more books than I've seen to this point um, they are just constantly are finishing books reading new books knowing what kinds of books they should be picking um, so that's very helpful and just the organization of those books it makes it easy for teachers to access them and put put them in the hands of students and um, have them continually reading Thank I you. see a huge gain from that so thanks it's powerful from you <laughs> yeah and, and, and then the, the second thing is and I hesitate to ask this because it's quite open-ended um, but um, my curiosity is getting the best of me and that is um, recently in the media the education secretary was quoted as expressing some concern about over testing um, and I was wondering from your perspective at Tucker um, do you have any thoughts about that um, I, I feel you know that's something that we're really careful of um, and in fact you know last year if you would have asked me my thoughts on that it was that we were a little too test preppy um, and we really tried to shift the focus last year to the idea that good teaching is going to result in good test scores. Um, and we're continuing that work and continuing that message. Um, so I don't think that the assessments we have in place are too much. I think that um, they're benchmarks, so they're, you know, they're spread out over time. Um, when we talk about having a predictive assessment, um, that would be done, you know, again, as an interim, so maybe two or three times throughout the year. Um, but Again, we really want the students to kind of know and own that data. Um, you know, one of the schools I worked at previously, every student knew their reading level. And it was a point of pride to them to be able to go home and say, I grew, grew three levels. And, you know, that's one thing we actually just started the conversation about as we were reviewing this. And we were like, wait, we have to table this. We have to finish our school improvement plan. Um, but just, you know, how much data are we going to share it with families so that they can own that data? Um, because there's a lot of power to that. You know, if the students know where they need to be and where they are, and the families really have a clear vision of that, it makes a huge difference. Knowing that your student is reading on a B and we want to get them to a D, now you're empowered to go into the library and look at texts that are considered a B and a C and see what's the difference and what do I need to do at home? What are the questions I need to ask? Um, so I think it, it's really, we're taking it as kind of knowledge is power and not that it, it's going to be overpowering for the kids. Bagley Jones. Hi, thank you. It was a great presentation and uh, I had a lot of really good data to share. I guess uh, Mike started to talk a little bit about what was on my mind. Not that you're <coughs> over teaching to the test, but every time we listen to a school psych council, that is the emphasis, the testing, the testing results. And that's very important and we need to pay attention to that. But I guess I would like to ask, you know, what, what do you do? And I know you do things at Tucker to look at the whole child not just the results of the test scores. I mean, I, I heard about support for new families, and I was really glad to hear that, because that's a huge thing to do at any school. I heard about a mentor program, but I wasn't sure if that was for academics only, or is it for the kids who come in looking like they maybe were worried yesterday and didn't sleep real well last night, and they might need a little friendly pat on the back. Sure. 
Okay, so those are some of the things I heard, and I just wondered, I heard a mention of the bullying prevention. I don't know how much social skills or bullying prevention stuff can, can be happening, but sort of looking at the social-emotional health. With Pierce in the high school, it's easier to tell because they have to have more programs for more kids that have developmentally different issues. But for our elementary schools, where do you fit in the kid who isn't a behavior problem but really isn't doing too well and isn't going to grow that level right away? Mm -hmm. Like they have some challenges. Where do they fit into this? So uh, when I got home tonight, first thing I heard, we had community circle today. Yay. And and <laughs> community circle, I said, oh, okay, great. You know, and our my mother-in-law is visiting, so we have to explain what that is. And uh, third grader did a great job of explaining that. And well, what what was, you know, these kids got awards, great. What did they get them for? Respect. I mean, right out of her mouth, like very clear. Clearly that they've been talking about respect, what that means in the classroom, and then that's followed up and emphasized by going to a community circle with the entire school um, and talking about respect and then rewarding that. And the connection for her was really, really clear. And she was happy, she didn't win, whatever, didn't matter. She was happy for the people that did and it was clear to her why they got an award about respect because they had been respectful and they had embodied that thing that they had all been talking about in class. So I think that's, that's some of the things that Elaine has brought to Tucker. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think it's a really special thing, and it's special, as Carrie was saying earlier, not because Elaine says this is going to be a special thing, though she does say that, <laughs> but because everyone else buys into it, mm -hmm. um, and because her enthusiasm brings that straight down to the kids, and they come home and talk about it to their mm -hmm. parents. So, and I would just add the the other two awards. So we always do three awards. So there's academic achievement a citizenship focus, and then there's one for excellent effort. So we are always acknowledging students who put that extra effort in. <coughs> um, and at the end of last year, we acknowledged students that made the most reading progress, but they weren't grade level, but they had made a tremendous amount of progress. So we were you know, looking for opportunities to recognize students in those ways. So that would be great, your next presentation, to add those things in, because mm -hmm. I think that's wonderful to be able to add those categories in of kids. who who. Who worked the hardest? Who tried the hardest? Mm -hmm. That's just as important as who got the A. So I'm really glad to hear you say that. Thank you. Thank you. Outstanding. Thank you. Does anybody want a candy? Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, I'd like to ask up to the table our athletic director, Larry Rooney. And accompanying Larry tonight is our high school principal, James Jett. So while uh, Mr. Rooney is uh, setting up his presentation, I was going to say this is the face behind all of the emails, but as Ms. Bagley Jones will tell you, uh, Larry Rooney is out and uh, a very, very visible athletic director. And Larry who? A very visible <laughs> athletic director. I was making a joke. Oh. oh. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, Ms. Padera has often mentioned, uh, I think between you and Ms. Padera, the enthusiasm of reinvigorating elementary school students and middle school students at football games and events. Um, I'm very appreciative to build a town-wide spirit. <coughs> Thank you all for having me tonight. Um, uh, it, it, a lot of exciting things going on within Milton High School Athletics um, with our teams, our student athletes, and certainly um, something we want to talk to you tonight about is our participation in athletics over the last couple of years. So um, I'm very appreciative of this opportunity that you've given me to share that with you as somewhat of the, the new athletic director now in my second year. Um, <coughs> 
Uh, our agenda tonight is to go over the, uh, an athletic overview, which will include our participation numbers, the importance of sports, um, the budget. Mr. Pavlicek will share a little bit with us about uh, the athletic budget. Uh, and some fundraising efforts that are going on and certainly talk about uh, some success and achievements that are happening within uh, athletics. <clears throat> okay, what we have in front of us here are all the sports teams that are offered by season uh, at Milton High School. And you'll notice um, <clears throat> each season there's about 10 different sports that are offered. Um, just to break those numbers down a little bit, uh, in the fall here, we have 10 sports, yet 24 different levels of sports between varsity, junior varsity, and freshman. Um, and that varies from sport to sport what those numbers are and uh, what's available uh, by gender and by sport. So in particular, uh, we have soccer here. That's both boys and girls, and we have varsity, junior varsity, and freshman soccer, so six teams um, uh, playing soccer, three each gender. Uh, in, the and in the winter time, <clears throat> the numbers are about 10 programs and about 20 different levels. And in the springtime, it's uh, about 11 programs and about 23 different levels. So <coughs> over the academic school year, we offer over 30 different programs and as close to 60 plus different um, teams between varsity, junior varsity, and freshman sports. Um, <clears throat> We're always looking for opportunity to increase our participation uh, with many of these sports, um, but sometimes there are some limitations based upon field availability or ice time availability or court time availability, uh, but we're always looking for that opportunity to do that. Um, <clears throat> the most important thing is that we, we have had an increase in numbers in a few different sports such as football in track and field in cross country over the last couple years. Um, so that's, um, those are some uh, very encouraging numbers. Okay, these next slides uh, we've shared with you in the diversity report over the last year or so. Um, <clears throat> and they go back as far as 2012 and 13. Uh, in last year, 2013, 2014, and into this fall season. And a couple of things that stand out uh, with me that in the fall of 2012, we had over, uh, about fo over 400 uh, athletes participating um, in the fall of 2012, about 340 in the winter of 2012 and 13, and in the spring of 2012-13, we had about 415 uh, student athletes, of which um, that's total participation of which the minority participation in 2012 and 13 ranged between 26% and 28%, with an increase in winter season um, up to about 31.4% of minority participation in winter sports. Um, as we get into the year of 2013 and 14, my first year here, um, <clears throat> the um, participation numbers um, were pretty strong. We had uh, over 400 student athletes participating. Minority participation was just shy of 30% in the fall. Uh, again, increased in the winter. Uh, minority participation uh, sports uh, just shy of 32%. And there was a big increase in minority participation in the spring of 2013-14, although the no overall numbers were down in the spring of 2013 and 14. Um, we, uh, we saw an increase in minority participation last spring. And if we look at uh, this current fall season, uh, numbers are in the 425, 450 range of those that registered to play fall sports, and our minority participation is just shy of 33%. Um, so we do see an, uh, a consistent increase in participation, both minority and overall participation, uh, which is very important to me. Um, and um, I think that uh, I think that lends itself to the importance of athletics along with academics um, uh, that is emphasized uh, here at the high school. This next slide um, breaks down by race and ethnicity in, uh, a three-year view. Um, going back 2012, 2013 to currently in the fall, and uh, the non-minority and minority participation in sports 
uh, where we see 2012 and 13 um, non-minority at 73 percent in minority just shy of uh, 27 percent and in increase uh, in minority participation last year in 2013 2014 to just under 30 percent and again um, this fall we are just shy of 33 percent minority participation um, which is, again it's it's an increase for the fall in minority participation um, and, and the numbers speak to uh, the amount of kids that are participating and the amount of minorities that are participating, which is very important. I see that going in the right direction for our student athletes here at the high school. <clears throat> any, any questions thus far on uh, any of those numbers? Ms. Sheridan? <clears throat> I wonder how the, and maybe you can't answer this question off the top of your head, but maybe James can, the, um, the difference here. So when you look at the non-minority to minority ratio, is that pretty similar to what it is for the school population as well? It's, actually, it's actually a little higher. Um, as of October 1st, the, the report that we submit to the state, uh, we had about 372 students self-identify as minority, as part of one of the minority groups, and we had 149 students participating in the sport in the fall. That's equivalent to about 40 percent of the minority population that's enrolled in the sport. One of the things that's not captured on here as well, if you saw the play this weekend, we have students, minority students in the play that may not, the musical, that may not necessarily play a sport, so it's important to say that they're involved in something. Mm -hmm. And that's what we want to make sure that we provide many opportunities for the students here at the high school. Thank you. Next, uh, Winter. Can I just follow up on that? Sure. So, so if you were to, the, the total population of the Milton High School, what are the percentages in terms of non-minority and minority? I, I would say about, what was that, 38 you had? 80% minority. And it, keep in mind, it fluctuated slightly from October 1st. You have move-ins. We had well over 29 or 30-something students. I, you know, I forget the exact number, but I could give that to you. Okay. We're going to get you the exact percentage. I know what it is, but before I say it. Do we know a bit about what the high school number is? 30 yes. Um, I have the number. In terms of minority students, uh, 392, I mean 372 students are minority, and as of October 1st, it was 968 students at Milton High School. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So as we look here over the last um, two years, and we've yet to take on our winter sports season, the numbers are pretty consistent with winter sports participation. Um, both non-minority and minority being in the 68 and 31 percent range or 68 and 32 percent range participation. Um, and, and we'd like to see that consistency um, and if anything um, an increase in numbers and an increase in participation um, with both no, uh, minority and non-minority. Okay. These next couple slides talk uh, about um, our participation in sports with those uh, in financial need, uh, free and reduced lunch, um, over the last uh, three years, um, going back to 2012 and 13. And we'll notice that um, about 13% in the, in the fall and spring uh, playing sports were on free and reduced lunch. And that number increased quite a bit in winter sports going back um, to a, just shy, uh, just over 19%. Uh, um, but the great thing is the amount of students that are on free and reduced lunch and the amount of students um, <clears throat> that are participating in sports, um, that's pretty high. And even though uh, some of our user fees may be a little bit high compared to our, our schools within the Bay State Conference, we're still getting our students in need coming out to play sports and we'll never turn a kid away um, that, that wants to be on the field playing sports we're always going to find a way to have our students participate in sports regardless of their financial need interrupt. <coughs> can I just interrupt as you go Larry so that sure. I can ask my question about that I know we can uh, find out how many kids from free and reduced but the kids who 
are not at the level of free and reduced, but just go up a little, if they come to you, the parents or the kid, we work out a system for them, a payment plan, because those are the kids that don't have the free and reduced, but really can't play the three sports, three kids a year at however much that adds up to be, plus great. the equipment and all that. Yeah. Great comment. We, we certainly have. Um, <coughs> at the beginning of each athletic season, fall, winter, and spring, I, I get um, quite a few phone calls and emails from, from parents and guardians asking if uh, we could work out a situation for payment of the user fees. And like those on free and reduced lunch, uh, we've worked out payment programs, whether they can pay on a weekly basis or a monthly basis, if they can pay the full amount at all. Um, we certainly have worked out programs with families to, to help those in need. And uh, some families have reached out to Mr. Jett. Um, you know, family circumstances have come up, <coughs> um, and uh, we, we've made um, extenuating circumstances for those families to, to be able to participate. Right. Again, we'll never turn a kid away that wants to play. Uh, and I think that's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Superintendent and then Ms. Sheridan. Um, very briefly, we talked about this today. Um, these lists of students uh, whose families identified as free and reduced are really protected information. But everybody understands that this is a subgroup in the testing. And so it's important for our principals to understand and know who these children are. And so that when we talk about targeted instruction and targeted programming and after school options, that our principals can uh, discreetly work with these families to encourage them, um, to encourage the children to go out and identify the children. And so uh, the head of our food service program, Jackie Morgan, just today, um, monthly, because life changes every month, um, is we give updated lists to the principals. They were issued today via email. I'll follow up with hard copy. And I suggested to Jackie Morgan that, um, again, families identify with their school principals. And so we're going to start to send weekly, um, quarterly, or perhaps monthly, but at least quarterly letters to families co-signed with the principal because mm -hmm. Jackie Morgan isn't a face that everyone might know and identify with. But if a letter goes out asking families if they want to um, sign up for free and reduced, it has the principal's name and the families relate to the principal. The letter will encourage families um, to call the principal to ask questions about just what that means. So we're going to try to improve our um, methods uh, for identifying and having families be comfortable about signing up uh, for the this re free and reduced and the um, uh, participation that it will enable children and uh, the lunch program and the breakfast program that will all directly <coughs> impact uh, their achievement in school. Can I ask a question about that? Anything. Ms. Sheridan, then Ms. Can I just follow up on that? Sure. The guidance folks? keep an eye out for kids that don't meet that criteria so that they can tell you? I would say a number of people do that from coaches to teachers. Okay. Again, you know, students develop a rapport with whether it's not their advisory teacher, whether it's a teacher, their favorite subject. So whatever the avenue, sometimes it's even Nurse Gibbons. So it could be anyone in the building okay. that they feel comfortable with. Thank you. Sure. Could you please go back to the previous slide? Sorry. So I'm just curious about the 65 students in the winter and versus 53 and 55 in the fall and the spring. Just curious, like, do they, if they're free and reduced, are they picking just one sport because that's all they can afford? And if they are, you know, is it that the winter sport is more attractive or, are the, you know, are they saving up? Like, I'm just wondering if there's a vehicle and maybe it's too much information, be sure. Feel free to say that to me. But I'm just curious if, you know, if these kids aren't self-identifying, if there's 65 of them wanting to participate in the winter, would they maybe want to do a spring sport too and just don't feel like they can ask? Well, see, that's kind of deceiving. If you look across the board, you could have some of our students are three sport athletes. So they could be in all three sports. Maybe that's just a sport in which they're interested in that just so happens to take place because in the, the winter. Number of yeah, you know what I mean? So it doesn't mean that you know, it's in isolation 53 in the fall, but it's, right. you know, some of the, some students in a different bucket, you just may have a different interest um, in the winter. 
because of the change of the sports. thinking about the total number. You're right. Thank you. So this speaks to um, our athletic participation free reduced lunch program for this current fall season and uh, where those numbers are at. 11.6% um, of our uh, student athletes uh, are on free and reduced lunch. <coughs> this next slide, uh, again, has been shared with you uh, in the diversity report um, and it goes back to the fall of 2013, uh, all of last year. and. Uh, it's a breakdown by team, and I think um, as you look at these numbers, my goal is to increase participation, in particular minority participation within all sports, but in particular uh, some sports that we're focusing our attention on is um, girls basketball, softball, baseball, and boys and girls lacrosse, uh, where we feel as though with some of our athletic department goals that we could uh, increase overall participation, but specifically <coughs> minority participation in those sports. Can you say those again, Larry? Um, <clears throat> girls basketball, okay. softball, baseball, and both boys and girls lacrosse. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll speak to in a few moments about uh, why there may be um, a lack of minority participation in some of these sports. Uh, but these are the, the real numbers over last year's um, athletic participation. Um, there are some challenges, um, and some of those challenges might be uh, the increased exposure to these sports at the youth level or the grassroots level. Uh, the actual cost of these sports for families as, as kids are in elementary and middle school, uh, some of these sports can be very expensive to um, be part of. And uh, those are some challenges that families face. Um, so, <clears throat> um, but it is a goal for us to make sure that we um, focus our attention on these specific sports to try to increase the minority participation. And here are the numbers from this current fall season. Um, uh, again, our focus uh, would be on uh, here, uh, boys cross country in golf, although, uh, Golf is down in overall participation from last year. We had 12 golfers last year, uh, 2013, and this year we had 10. Uh, so it was one of those sports where we did not make cuts. Um, <clears throat> I will say, I, I looked at the numbers from the previous slide of girls cross country to the fall of this current year, and um, the minority participation in girls cross country went up um, by six. Um, not a percentage number, but a actual athlete number, um, which is which is a great job by Coach Tom Shaw by being very inclusive of all the student athletes, um, in particular uh, cross country. <clears throat> Mr. Jet just spoke about. Uh, okay. Can I just add one more thing? It's important to highlight. If you look right here and you look at the category under crew. In 2013, the fall. There was no, no minority participation. Same thing with the winter. Uh, excuse me, uh, where am I, the crew? But if you look here, now boys crew and girls crew, you're seeing an increase in that. Mm -hmm. um, and it goes back to the point that we were making earlier. It's all about the exposure. I had a conversation with someone earlier, and I was just explaining last year, even with girls hockey, we had to seek a waiver and reach down to our eighth grade students just to make sure we had enough students to participate to run just the varsity. We didn't even have a JV uh, girls hockey team last year. So again, our goal is to continue to communicate with the elementary principals and Mr. Rooney to talk about some of those efforts that he's undertaken to try to get a lot of students exposed to the participation. And then at the end, when we talk about it, unfortunately in some of these sports we have caps as well. Mm -hmm. Unless, of course, we're going to increase and add more sports or more <coughs> coaches, uh, we do have caps in, uh, in terms of how many students that could be on the team. This next slide, uh, Mr. Jett already talked about, is the uh, overall enrollment at the high school as of October 1st. How many of those students identified themselves as uh, minorities and how many from the fall sports season uh, participated um, 
on, uh, on a fall sports team or registered on a fall sports team. Um, and again, um, many of uh, the minorities also participate in many other extracurricular activities at the high school, whether it's clubs or community um, service initiatives, certainly the arts. Um, so it's, it's important that all of our kids are participating, not just in athletics, but in, in what the high school has to offer. Um, you know, in talking with my coaches and my student athletes, you know, the thing that I say to them as it comes to athletics, it, are you getting the most out of what Milton High School has to offer? And are you giving back and making Milton High School a better place by playing sports? In, in whether that's uh, the non-minorities or the minorities participate, participating in athletics, it's important that our kids are taking advantage of what is offered here and then making Milton High School a better place through athletics. <clears throat> this just goes back to... Um, Ms. Kelly, uh, sorry. Sorry, before we go from that... Sure. Um, do we, for, for last year, do we know how many students played one sport or more? So in other words, how many individual students from Milton High School did sports touch, I guess would be another way of putting it, for last year? I think that would be a good number to have yes. so that we sort of get that sense. And, that number. and, and just so you know, we, I, we can definitely look at that. And you may see that our, our enrollment fluctuates a little bit here at the mm -hmm. high school. We have a pre-K program. I don't know if sometimes that gets factored into our enrollment. And also we have students who move in, who move out. This was the number according to what we got from our, our, data, our person that helps us with the data, Jane Barrett, on the, from the first. But we could definitely look into that. Um, we did not do that for this presentation. Okay. Thanks. We are keeping better track of all of our students um, <clears throat> last winter and last spring, but definitely this year with our Administrative Plus system, our new Redeker uh, system, of what kids are doing on day one in September, fall sports, winter sports, spring sports, right through the four years that they're here at Milton High School. Right. And um, that's important because that's part of uh, their transcript, not just how they do in the classroom, but uh, what they're doing outside of the classroom and what activities and what sports uh, they're taking on. Yep. Great. Uh, some of the challenges for our student athletes with participating in sports, um, I mentioned early exposure uh, to various sports uh, in town um, and uh, the enhancement of middle school sports programs. Um, we're looking to add middle school sports teams uh, in, in this talks going on right now with Dr. Karen Spaulding and um, Superintendent Gormley ab about the possibility of increasing middle school sports. Um, <clears throat> skill level sports so uh, sports that we need to make cuts in those that don't need to or could support a larger group of, of student athletes, uh, that's a challenge. For example, uh, if I remember correctly from uh, winter sports last year, our boys basketball program alone had about 75 student athletes try out for three teams. And at the very maximum, each team could take about 15. Well, that adds up to 45, and about 30 kids were cut from boys' basketball. Um, what we've done within athletics here, um, both through basketball, but myself and other coaches, is we've encouraged those kids to join indoor track, or we've encouraged those kids to participate in other sports offered during that season. So they do have a place to go at 2.20 in the afternoon, and they still want to play a sport, in, and we're helping them do that. Um, but there are certain sports that can only take a certain number, and there are other sports that we can expand that number a little bit, uh, such as football in the fall or cross country or indoor track in the winter or outdoor track in the spring. Um, but those are some challenges with cut sports versus non-cut sports. Certainly, uh, transportation can be an issue for families, um, uh, getting to and from school, to and from practice, to and from games um, at times. Some of our kids have real uh, family obligations that uh, come ahead of uh, their extracurriculars, such as jobs or child care. Um, and, and again, we hope that all of our kids um, have interests beyond athletics that they're participating in, in w whether it's clubs or activities or uh, the performing arts or visual arts. Um, something that I've experienced as a father and um, 
as a coach, uh, outside club teams have really become popular in a lot of sports. Um, you may have heard the term AAU, which is the American Amateur Union, very popular in certain sports, baseball and basketball, um, select teams or travel teams. This has really pulled it kids and pulled it families to try to play at elite levels um, and taken away f the opportunity for kids to play for their high school. And that's a real challenge for people. Uh, some of these sports are very expensive outside um, of the high school and to ask kids to play on two teams and then uh, pay for two teams is a real challenge for families and um, obviously the athletic fees that we have in, in the budget that we have in place can be a challenge as well. Sure. Could you, okay, I'm sorry, after Lynn. I just want to clarify the transportation um, bullet there. Are you referring to kids being able to get transportation back and forth to after school sports or do you mean the cost of actually transporting them to games or away games? It, it's for kids, for some, for some kids, it's transportation to and from practices that's outside of the norm of getting on the after school bus. Um, our baseball team practices at Cunningham Park. Our cross country teams uh, run over at Houghton's Pond. Our boys and girls hockey team uh, play and practice at Euland Rink. So it's those sports that um, are off campus um, where kids need to get rides and sometimes that puts a strain on family to get their kids to and from those facilities. If I might. Sure. Certainly transportation is a big cost <laughs> within the athletic uh, department uh, and, and, but that's, uh, that's one of our challenges. Uh, but, but families certainly have their challenges as well with transportation. Um, I think that your high school marries your community. And I've uh, said among us in the school district that this early exposure to various sports is huge in this town and in society. And so when you see the fields full um, in Milton for all these different sports, and I don't participate in any of those sports, and I get to the high school, I'm competing against children who since pre-kindergarten and elementary school had been on the fields or on the ice or on these teams. And so um, we have an individual who's reached out to Larry Rooney and myself, uh, uh, elementary soccer, and he's looking to um, come up with ways to reach out through our parent liaison, um, to actually reach out to families uh, and how to get families involved in town sports. I think it's so ironic you put this first, Larry. I think this is a huge issue. I personally think the forms are impossible to read, um, and I don't think people get the information um, through if they don't get the times. I don't know how people find out about all of these teams and the sign up and when to sign up and what the deadline is. So um, just seeing athletics at Milton High and uh, hearing the conversation about all of these teams and having to start when you're so young, I think it's really uh, incumbent upon the community uh, to look at these uh, sports teams town-wide and see if they reflect the diversity and the economic diversity of the town. And um, I th think that there are ways. I can't take on the sports in the town, but I talk to everybody that I possibly can, and we do have somebody reaching out now that wants to work with us at the elementary level about uh, town-wide sports. But I think it's got to have a correlation uh, to participation at the high school, especially when you talk about teams that cut. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And um, <clears throat> some ideas that I have or we have um, to increase participation, both diversity and overall participation in sports, uh, Mr. Jett, if you don't, um, <clears throat> is to build that partnership with our Milton Parks and Rec Department mm -hmm. that uh, head up the youth sports programs in town, in particular what they call MISAC or the Milton Youth Sports Advisory Council. One of my goals is to meet with all the leaders of these youth sports organization and see what they are doing about um, their participation and the minority participation in their sport um, at the grassroots level, um, right down to kindergarten or grade one and, and what kind of exposure um, are they allowing 
um, those that might need more resources um, to, to be able to participate in their sport. And may I say one more final word on that? And again, when I talked about the um, advertisement and the forms and difficult to read, I think they're all um, people who want to um, diversify the teams, but I think it's just a matter of reaching out and making these sign-ups easier for people and better publicizing deadlines and options for free and reduced. So many of the people who have led these said to me, well, you know, I'm more than willing um, to make accommodations around free and reduced, but I think it's getting the word out and reaching out to the community. Mm -hmm. Ms. Padera and then Mr. Zulus. I was just going to ask, and I know you're talking about your partnerships, which I knew was coming up next, but have you have you started to look at whether the same reflection that we're seeing here in um, diversity is the same in the youth sports in the town? Because it would just be interesting to see if this is happening and when, when it's happening or if it's always been that way, as um, Superintendent Gormley says, is just they're never getting some of these sports. If you're trying out in high school you know, and never played organized hockey before, it's going to be really difficult to make the hockey team as well as the basketball team as well as probably other sports as well like that. So I'm just wondering if that could be something we look at is it's reflected the same at some of these sports. And I would, um, I would agree with the sentiment that, you know, we talk a lot about athletic fees here, and, but they're much cheaper than what the youth people are paying for youth sports is. Um, for basketball, for hockey, for sure. all these equipment sports. So it is difficult. It's expensive. It's also one of these things you do kind of hear word of mouth where if your friend's in it mm -hmm. and um, they tell you about it, I mean, they're all the programs in Milton Parks and Rec that send out, but there's even um, more intense sports outside of Parks and Rec that, special, that ha ha help kids specialize and get better in other sports. And it really is kind of a parent informational source where you learn it. Um, so I'm just wondering if we can look, when you're doing through these partnerships, if you look at and see if they have the same problems that we're having, at, it's reflected the same from youth to, um, to high school. And then just the other thing on the last slide I was going to ask is it does look I know we have to make cuts, and um, it's especially frustrating for me to think about freshmen cut from sports because it really is feels like the end. You know, yeah. the, the, many of them don't come back, even if you tell them to encourage them to work on it, come back sophomore year, they're kind of crushed. And, mm -hmm. you know, um, I always think of the little minor trivia that Michael Jordan was cut from the freshman basketball team. You know, if, what if he didn't come back, you know? Yeah. So I think about other avenues of um, encouraging these kids to, if they're just maybe behind by a year and they need to try harder, but also do we have any intramural um, avenues that they can participate in? Because it's, as much as I like track, not everybody does, and so to say, well, why don't you do cross country? It's different from basketball or the other sports they're trying out for, and do we have any other avenues we can kind of um, send those kids to so they can either maybe perfect their skill or mature a little bit, grow a little bit, um, you know, or is there any way to really encourage, try to take more kids that freshman year when they can have a little room to develop without um, watering down our programs or overloading our coaches, you know. Um, great comments and <clears throat> the question about intramurals, um, I'd love for all kids, if, if they weren't able to make a freshman team or a JV team or a varsity team, to continue to play a sport that they love, even if it's at the intramural level. Um, we don't lack gym space, but we'd, we'd lack time and gym space to be able to create another team, a program. Um, we, we could always look at it, but it would be difficult to fit into the current winter schedule. That Copeland Fieldhouse is jammed Monday through Saturday with that current uh, six basketball teams, two wrestling teams, indoor track, um, cheerleading, um, so to find time. It is unfortunate. Um, I face it right now myself with my own children in, in whether or not they're going to be able to play high school sports. And, um, but the great thing that I think Milton High School does have is, is those other opportunities. Um, crew over the last three or four years have become very popular and some kids that may not have played football or soccer in the fall 
have won state championships for our crew program. Um, and um, and those, those kids are training right through the winter and, and participating again in, in the springtime. Uh, our cross country numbers and indoor track and outdoor track numbers have increased over the last uh, couple years uh, due to encouraging kids to participate in those sports if some of the uh, team skill oriented sports didn't work out for them. So, And if I can add, I know this presentation is about sports participation. There's also clubs, there's also interests. Um, again, I'm having this conversation as the principal of the high school and the father of two daughters and wanting them to get involved in sports. Trust me, I pushed, I struggled, I threatened, um, and they just didn't like it. <laughs> they just didn't like it. And one of my daughters was a late bloomer in art and went into art, and my youngest daughter is into the math and sciences. So again, it's all, it's a, part of it is interest-based, yep. and it's tough to push somebody in an area in which they're not really interested in, and then throw $300 or $700, depending on the sport. So it's, it, it is a challenge. And then the last piece that I add about the um, intramurals, once the weather gets warm, you'll see a number of students, yep. trust me, it's not for a lack of not participating. They're down at the, uh, they're down at the courts, they're climbing the fence, trying to get in the Brookfield. They're in this uh, field house when they get a, a moment to go and play basketball. Trust me, I go out there and hurt myself and play with them. Um, so students are in this building and they are doing something. And some just work out. Some go into the weight room, in the Nautilus room, which we'll talk about later, to work out. Can I, Larry, just another thing? Just the Zulus, then. Oh, okay. Baby. Oh. Uh, j just a quick point um, in terms of early exposure. Uh, it seems to me that that's an easily improved item um, along the lines of what the library and the schools have done in the last few years in terms of coordinating exposure to those younger students. Um, as an anecdote, um, last year the only reason that my uh, kindergartner was signed up for soccer was I just happened to talk to someone at a principal's event about, and someone mentioned it to me. That's the only way I knew about it. So it seems to me that kind of coordination that we had with the libraries, with the library rather, and the schools, something along those lines might help getting more exposure to the, to the younger, newer parents. And, and um, uh, that kind of coordination seems to me uh, that's, that's kind of low-hanging fruit, you know? Well, Larry and I are attempting to do that now. And I will say this, as a person who's a football, basketball, and track lover, because of my exposure with girls hockey at the high school, I got a, a passion for it. That is my favorite sport now. <laughs> and so I would say that to anybody out there that's watching. Again, it's getting out, it's seeing, observing, and it's really growing, having an appreciation for it. I think that in terms of the Milton Park and Rex, that that's a whole other job for Larry to do. I think it's an important one, but it's a broad-based, it has to be a broad-based appeal. And basically, I would just say to them, you know, what does Walpole do? Because Walpole wins every single mm -hmm. game of every single sport that they do. Right. Um, it, right? Am I not right on that? Almost. Oh, okay. <laughs> Almost. But most of the times they do. Not but rugby. They have it, <laughs> but they have it from day one all the way through high school. But that's, I mean, it's important for us to do that, but that's beyond what you need to do as the athletic director. Right. It's got to be. This. We have a lot of students. Think about it. 400 and something students. Only 50% of the student population participating in the sport. And I can't speak to Walpole. I don't know. I'm not sure if Walpole has the diversity that we have. Um, so if participation, again, 400, and 400 uh, plus students participating in a fall sport. When you have 900 something students, that's a lot. And then my other point to just follow up on that was that there are also other economics involved, uh, not just the fee, but your lacrosse stick, your guards, your shoes, basketball, your shoes, um, the sticks that you need, golf clubs, golf t shirts you gotta wear on the court. I mean, there's a lot of other economic issues involved sure. that we can't take on, no. but I do think that that's part of it as well. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, for whatever that's worth. Sports have become very expensive. I'm, I'm the father of three hockey players, and it's probably the most expensive yep. sport, um, spending thousands of dollars a year uh, to have our kids on youth teams or travel teams, and it's one of the more expensive sports here at the high school as well. So uh, it's certainly, um, you know, the fees involved uh, are certainly a big challenge for some families. 
a couple other things that we're doing to in increase diversity and participation in sports, um, partnering with the Parks and Rec, uh, trying to improve or um, increase middle school sports programs, um, meeting at the Pierce School, uh, our varsity coaches and our captains going down in, in promoting Milton High School and Milton High School athletics. And in particular, um, next Wednesday, we have uh, an eighth grade info night, uh, info morning, uh, where we're uh, having the eighth graders come up and find out about Milton High School athletics, clubs and activities. Uh, we're gonna set up tables in the gymnasium and have our team uh, representatives, team captains, be able to talk about their specific programs. Um, so our eighth graders are starting to uh, think a little bit about where they're gonna be next year and, and what sports might be available to them. Um, our guidance department in athletics as well as the arts uh, last year did a, did a uh, college info night and we brought in some admissions offices from different colleges and universities to talk about being a recruited student athlete or a recruited um, arts student and, um, and what that looks like and we plan on doing the same in the winter. Um, you know, Superintendent Gormley, you talked about um, families having that exposure to uh, youth sports and sign-ups and how difficult and challenging that can be. Before I came on board, um, registrations for some families um, may have been challenging if they didn't have the resources to sign up or how to sign up, not just the money uh, to pay those user fees. And we've been more flexible allowing our students to, um, not encouraging it, but uh, sign up after a certain date um, and still participate in that sport um, of those that have the extra kids playing. And I think that has really done a great job last fall with football and uh, certainly this fall with cross country and, and, and football and cheer as well. Uh, so we're being more flexible with those families that might not have the resources to sign up. And uh, that's important to get our kids involved. The facilities that we uh, uh, play at, uh, you know, we're so fortunate of the Copeland Family Foundation and the support that they give Milton High School. We have a fantastic Copeland Fieldhouse where many of our teams play at uh, basketball and wrestling and indoor track and cheer, uh, volleyball, um, and uh, as well as Brooksfield. Uh, we just had um, Brooksfield uh, newly turfed last year. Uh, again, with the support of the Copley, Copeland Family Foundation. Um, right now, our weight room and cardio room, even though Milton High School is still fairly new, um, less than 10 years old or approaching our 10th year, um, we have a fundraising effort to up, upgrade uh, weight room and cardio room. Um, as we look at some of our competitors within the Bay State Conference, uh, we, you know, like our science lab or like our classrooms, we need to help our coaches prepare our student athletes off the field, away from games, and it's in the weight room and cardio room that our student athletes need to best prepare uh, for those contests. Uh, so here are some of the uh, facilities that our, our student athletes play at around town. And, um, and again, we're very fortunate that we have great facilities here on campus. <clears throat> Some of the uh, expectations of our, that we have of our student athletes, um, I look at it as an academic and athletic partnership where it's school first and athletics um, second. And, uh, you know, what goes on in the classroom and what goes on on the athletic fields, you know, it, it helps our kids learn time management skills and organizational skills that carry over both with athletics uh, and, and academics. And one of the main things that we really talk about with the kids is advocating for themselves um, as student athletes. If, if one of our students had a question uh, for his or her math teacher, uh, as parents, we, we certainly would want them to go and talk to their teacher. Well, we expect the same as an athlete, is that if there's an issue that they might have um, with their role on a team, or a scheduling issue, or um, you know, playing time, anything um, that we, we expect our students to advocate, our student athletes to advocate for themselves and go and speak to their, to their coach about what that means and have that open dialogue and feel comfortable enough to do so. Um, Mr. Jett talks about this all the time and it's very important to me as well is, is respect for themselves, respect for their peers and adults and teachers, respect for the school and property and the administration, 
that these student athletes, uh, they represent themselves, their family, their teams, their school, whether they're playing or whether they're um, out in the community on the weekends, that it's very important that they're always uh, representing Milton High School. Um, and that's something that's very important as a student athlete here at the high school. Um, next slide. Anything you want to add to that? Communication. Uh, I mentioned it uh, a minute ago with students advocating for themselves, but uh, we want our students to be able to have open dialogue with their coaches um, and um, call it the chain of command, but we hope that along with teaching kills, uh, kids the skills of a specific sport, that we're teaching them how to advocate for themselves and go to a coach uh, about different issues that might arise uh, during an athletic season. And if, if it's an issue that needs to um, go beyond a coach that uh, parents and student athletes feel comfortable enough to come to me as the athletic director or our principals here in the building um, to talk about those issues and to help kids work through those issues with their, uh, with their coaches and the role that they play on their team. Also with that is how do we communicate with families? Um, certainly by our email blasts or phone um, uh, phone alerts that we send out. Our schedules are all on our athletic headline pages. Uh, we promote athletics in the back to school nights and the PTO meetings, certainly parent information nights, the new student orientation at the beginning of each school year. Um, and we have the student assembly coming up um, on the 19th of Oct uh, uh, November here, so we, where we promote the athletics. Just a couple brief points about why we think athletics are so important here at the high school, but in general for our teenagers. Um, when participating in extracurricular activities such as athletics, students' grade point average increase and overall academic experience is enriched. Um, they learn time management skills, organizational skills, leadership skills that carry over into the classroom and later on in life. And when participation uh, in athletics, students make better decisions around relationships, drugs and alcohol, and with the difficult issues that teenagers face today in society. Um, so uh, it, it, it's extremely important that our uh, students uh, in the classroom and out of the classroom uh, are learning these skills, not just to have success while they're here at the high school, but also when they leave Milton High School. Um, we hope not too many, but for some of our students, um, sports is the hook to keep them here. And uh, I think that's important for us and for those students that being part of a team is so powerful and that it can help our students be accountable. It can help them own their role in the community. Uh, again, learning those life skills of effort, perseverance, dealing with success and failure, and um, how to be positive role models in the community. Um, athletics is an extension of the classroom and for our coaches it is their classroom um, by teaching and coaching the sports specific skills and also the life skills that are needed to move beyond the walls of Milton High School or the fields that our kids play on. So we see again athletics and academics as a partnership here where we're helping our kids learn those skills um, on and off the field. Mr. Pavlicek cover <laughs> our athletic budget and some fundraising uh, efforts that we have. Well, as you can see from this, um, these, this is just a, a quick summary of our expenditures over the last two fiscal years. Um, athletics is a roughly three quarters of a million dollar operation. Um, and it is only partially funded through the general fund. A large portion is from revolving fund, which is our fee collections and so forth, the fees people pay. Student accounts uh, is the fundraising that uh, is done by the various different teams. Um, the Pierce Revolving Fund shows up this year because with uh, last year we introduced the uh, um, Pierce Sports, and so that's a fee collection from Pierce Sports. The Copeland Banner Fund was one from two years ago. Um, and you know, noticeable by its absence last year. Um, this is the, the, the sales of the uh, banner hanging rights uh, in the field house and once upon a time along Guile Road as well on the poles. Um, and noticeable last year, we didn't have anyone who was uh, actively 
renting out those banners, so we saw a drop off in revenues, and we had, didn't end up actually spending anything out of that account last year because we just didn't have it really enough in it to do. I think that most of that is one thing that jumps off at this. The other piece is the use of the revolving from fund uh, the fees from 13 to 14. There's two pieces involved there. Um, one is at the beginning of fiscal 13, the um, revolving fund was badly depleted. So we actually had to use about $30,000 worth of fees that were collected in 13, 14 just to build it up to the spot where we could leave it at the end of the year. So there was part about $30,000 worth of fees where we, we keep a, a balance at the end of the year and we had to build that balance up. Um, so that is actually the amount spent out of it, not the amount um, raised. So really the, the jump in um, the fund from 13 to 14 is we actually raised about $50,000 more in fiscal 14 through fees and the like than we did in fiscal 13. Um, that's partially to do with collections, partially to do with participation, a variety of different things like that. It isn't as, uh, as I said, those are expenditures, those aren't revenues. The 313 is actually the revenues uh, from um, for last year because in 14 we ended the year with the same balance we started the year with the same seed so the 313,000 is approximately the amount we take in through fees through uh, athletic fees during the year the year before as I say it was about it was about 270,000 because we had to build up the balance for the end of the years to carry over so um, you know and the general fund basically makes up whatever's left uh, so we just have to find a way to, to deal with it through the general fund. 14, I think, uh, going forward is really the model for 15. Hopefully we can get someone who would like to be a banner salesman and we can, if, if we have people out there who would like to market our banners, um, that, that is a good source of income. Um, I just, the only other thing I'd say on here is the one piece that's not here is the boosters. Uh, the boosters are a separate entity. They buy, uh, equipment, uh, uniforms, various different things. They make contributions to the clubs, but they, they don't run through us. They're their own entity. And so we don't count on them, but they, they do supplement what uh, the athletic budget uh, does internally. Ms. Kelly? So sorry, and I may have missed this in your explanation. The increase is 35K? Or so you tell me the exact number. I'm sure from 13 from to 13 14. to 14, and what do we attribute that to? It, it's a it's actually more. It's closer to fifty thousand dollars. Okay, so what what's the additional spending that we're spending that we didn't spend in 13? We so this is expenditures, right? Right. Yeah. We didn't um, we didn't use the we really overran the general fund in 13 to a significant uh, that the the spending in fiscal 13 the 400 thousand from the general fund was a hundred and something thousand more than we had actually budgeted, 125,000 more than we had actually budgeted from the general fund. So we had to make some adjustments in the, you know, we had to pay out, uh, go over budget in the general fund on athletics just to, to, uh, to finish the year in 13. Right, so so, so I'm just looking at, these look like expenditures that went out on thir in 13 versus 14. It's a 50K increase, let's say, if that's the number. So what additionally are we spending the money on in 14 that we didn't spend it on in 13? Because that's a huge jump, I think. Well, you don't even have to be in Well, I mean, it, in, let's see if I can. And if we don't have this. the answers now, that's well, fine. Well, it, it, it's, it's all in one risk. pot. That's the issue. I mean, there's, um, we, we spent some coaches. We, we paid for coaches in, four, in 13 out of the general fund that we had planned on. Uh, paying for out of the revolving fund, but we didn't have enough money in the revolving fund to do it, so we paid for them out of the general fund. So I think you're missing my point. It doesn't matter where the funds came from. Ultimately, we're saying on this sheet, and maybe we need to go mm -hmm. back and look at these numbers, it's saying that we spent more, 50K more in 14 than we did in 13. What oh. I'm looking for is, okay, so what kinds of things were we spending the money on? And, and again, if we don't have the answers now, that's not a problem that as we move through the budget process, we can we can hopefully get that level of detail and figure right. out. We have, you know, you're looking at it from 723 to 766. So you're looking at $43,000 more that we spent on athletics right. over the year, yep. right? Which is, um, which is about 6%. So I doubt that was couch, coaches increase in their rates. Co <laughs> so I guess I'm just well, looking for it. 
So, some of it is we had, um, for instance, in 14, we had a lot of tournaments. Tournaments cost money. We have to pay for extra buses. There's extra coaches. There's extra security okay. and so forth. And if that's so the answer, I'm just asking the th question. There are a variety of different let's, things let's like let's that. Let's figure out what the actual coaches' salaries are. do. Um, you know, coaches' salaries are about two hundred thousand dollars of the budget. Two hundred to two hundred fifty thousand dollars of the budget for all the different coaches, um, and that doesn't include officials and uh, you know police details and things like that for all the different pieces so the a, a good deal of it is is actually uh, salary you know not quite half um, and so that that does certainly go up but it's not forty yeah, thousand dollars worth yeah. but it, it's you know probably fifteen thousand dollars worth of it is is just in adjustments to salary over the year and as I say the other we you know when you, when you have tournaments there are tournament fees there are uh, a variety of different things and also I think um, fiscal 14 for instance we had um, Thanksgiving Day game and that's a, that we only get that every other year and that's a big gate receipt you so know well, but why don't we work to get a precise answer yes. Mr. Zulu. just a quick one um, uh, for fiscal 15 Early in the budget process, we were trying to uh, budget an, an additional 100000 from the general fund. Where, do you remember, Glenn, where we ended up on that? It's in. Oh, I know it's in, but was it the whole 100000 in? Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah, in fiscal 14, we actually added money during the year by reallocating money. Fiscal 15, we built it in. We built it in. That's right. Okay. So <clears throat> some of the fundraising efforts that we have in place to help um, defray the costs of, of sports and help our teams, um, and, and I mentioned earlier about our weight room and cardio room, is we currently have a prize calendar raffle in which our student athletes are selling uh, calendars in the community um, to help support uh, the renovations of the weight room and cardio room. Um, <clears throat> This goes back to um, the loss that we all had last fall uh, of Evan Jones and uh, immediately the exercise for Evan um, that went on fall of 13 and again fall of 14. Um, one of Evan's goals and, and legacies that he left was the improvement of that weight room. And we've been very fortunate enough to start with about $15,000 from the two exercise for Evan events and we're hoping with this prize calendar raffle that our student athletes and teams are taking on that we could raise another forty or fifty thousand dollars on top of that fifteen thousand that we currently have in order to renovate and upgrade um, that weight room so that's a a big undertaking that uh, our athletic department and our student athletes are taking on right now um, and, and if I could just interject forty to fifty thousand dollars is a lofty goal so I say for those who are out there that watch and make sure you purchase one of those calendars <laughs> <laughs> have them now? Mm -hmm. do you have any now to sell we'll make sure you have them and we'll make sure there's some in the front office and how much are they ten dollars a piece okay. and you have the opportunity to win cash prizes prizes such as TD Bank uh, tickets to a Celtics game or to a Bruins game there's a lot of wonderful prizes on there you know along with selling I'm sorry no, I was just gonna say where where can we buy them do all the schools have them do all the elementary schools have them too or the elementary schools do not have them every sports team with all of the students on the sports so ideally the assumption would be you know 425 athletes would have okay. at least 10 each but tomorrow we could put them in every front office of the uh, elementaries in the middle Absolutely. school and um, efforts like this uh, take uh, you work full time mm -hmm. so I'd like you to recognize the three freshman parents who came forward and have taken over responsibility for this fundraising effort um, <clears throat> I had I had one in particular but two others join uh, freshman parents approached me last winter last spring about ways that we could uh, raise funds to help improve um, athletic facilities and in particular the weight room <clears throat> and cardio room uh, one is Amy Domino, who, who took the lead here. Uh, she's been fantastic and very energetic and enthusiastic about uh, getting this going. And along with Amy um, is Ursula McMillan and Marion Driscoll, again, parents of, of uh, Milton High School student athletes. And they've been fantastic with um, really leading this, 
leading this effort and um, being out there in the community asking our <clears throat> our community for uh, Celtics tickets or Bruins tickets or restaurant gift cards or donations uh, to help support this calendar sales raffle and it, it, without these um, parents um, we wouldn't be where we are today with this effort so we're hoping that we have a strong month of November with our student athletes selling these calendars um, I really look forward to next September having our students come back to school in a brand new weight room and cardio room um, with new equipment, newly painted, and having our student athletes excited about um, improving their skills again off the field. Um, but again, it's to the efforts of these three, these three parents um, and our student athletes throughout the month of November that it's going to help make this happen. You know, I look at this not just asking our kids to sell calendars for money. I really look at this as a, uh, a way that the community can come together and uh, improve our facilities and um, uh, you know uh, w whether people in town have children here at the high school we see uh, the community the, t the community of Milton come out to our football games come out to our basketball games uh, come out to our volleyball games when we're in the playoffs and they see our facilities and so it, it's more than just raising funds to improve our facilities it's, it's a nice community builder for our kids and it gets them excited about being part of this community and it gets them excited about wearing the Milton High School jersey um, and, and playing on our sports team so uh, we, we really do hope that this is a, a successful effort. Um, some other fundraisers that are always in place, um, Mr. Pavlicek mentioned uh, Boosters but our Boosters does a great job with the bottle and can drive and our car washes throughout the fall and winter and spring. Um, and those raise funds for our individual teams to uh, have money in their in their accounts to uh, you know help with any uniform purchases. Uh, so <coughs> Boosters does a great job, and uh, we're always looking for uh, donations in the community. Um, you know for these fundraising uh, <coughs> efforts as well. A couple um, highlights: many of our teams throughout each season. Uh, produce Bay State Conference All-Stars um, and too many to list on any one slide in any one night um, but fall winter and spring we have two to three to four sometimes as many as five student athletes representing Milton High School as Bay State Conference All-Stars but there are three in particular most recently that we want to highlight um, Olivia Tabor is a volleyball player who is a Bay State Conference All-Star and just recently was named to the Eastern Mass All-Stars uh, for volleyball. She had a fantastic vo uh, volleyball career, and in particular senior season. Uh, if anybody had a chance to go to the um, Milton vs. St. Peter Marion game, she was dominant out there. So uh, uh, Olivia, uh, great job. Lloyd Hill, um, in Ben Kelly's short time as, as golf coach, he represented Milton High School in the MIA golf tournament, um, shooting a par 71 at the regionals qualifying him for the MIA tournament um, last week he finished 21st out of 38 in the state which is um, quite an accomplishment for one of our golfers and Lloyd is a three sport athlete here at the high school three sport captain um, represents Milton High School very well and I think it could be our first and only All-American last year Jonathan Carrera wrestler finished sixth in the country, country uh, at Lehigh University um, in the high school national wrestling tournament and um, uh, again we don't know if we have any other All-Americans in other sports but he certainly is uh, the first wrestling All-American to represent Milton High School quite an accomplishment for one of our alumni uh, Jonathan currently is at uh, Wyoming Seminary Prep School and has been accepted to the Naval Academy to wrestle in uh, the year of 2015, 2016, his freshman year. So uh, we hope to have Jonathan back this winter at some point to help celebrate his um, All-American status. Um, some support systems that we have in place for our student athletes. Uh, our guidance department, we have the college planning process along with myself and our coaches. Um, guidance does a great job with helping our student-athletes navigate you know through the college process 
Uh, our coaches meeting with uh, here at Milton High School and within the Bay State Conference is a great resource for our student athletes. Our Legends Athletic Directors within the Bay State Captains as Leaders workshops at the beginning of each uh, academic year and uh, they held one this past August which over 30 of our student athletes attended over at Dedham High School. Uh, so that was well attended by our student athletes. Uh, the MIAA, which is the uh, Massachusetts Interscholastic Athletic Association, our governing body, holds many student athlete leadership conferences. And I attended one um, two weeks ago with four of our seniors. It was a great event on health and wellness within sports. And um, um, so the MIAA really supports our student athletes as well. Our co coaches, teachers, and administration. Uh, there's a homework club that our kids uh, attend. Um, certainly our teachers do a great job with before school and after school tutoring and extra help sessions. And as Mr. Pavlicek mentioned previously, our Milton High School Boosters does a fantastic job with supporting our teams, whether it's the swing for sports and the, the monies that they raise there. Um, but any time our teams need uniforms or in need of uniforms or equipment that um, uh, that really either aren't part of the budget or are tough to come up with within the budget, our boosters are always there to help support us and, and we appreciate um, all that they do for us, whether they're out at the football or Brooksfield games or inside here during the winter games, um, manning those snack shops. Our boosters does a great job. So. Thank you all for your, having me here tonight. Uh, we look forward to having you out at our games uh, during the winter. And uh, if you have any questions for me, I'm, you're welcome to take those. I'll be quick. It's not a question, but a comment. Um, I really like the communication. I think this was a fabulous job. I like that if I call, I hear the games on your phone, your voicemail. Today, the games at Milton High are blah, 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 blah. I think that is great. The outreach to the community has really been fabulous and appreciated. Um, and I can't say enough about what the sports meant to both of my kids at Milton High School. It helped them get here on time. It helped them get here. <laughs> they knew if they didn't come, they couldn't practice. If they didn't practice, they couldn't play. Um, so, And those are my kids who, school committee, you know, what do you mean you don't want to go to school? So it really does help kids tremendously, and I'm so appreciative of it. Um, and the final thing I wanted to say was that the Copeland Fieldhouse has done is an incredible um, talent that we have. And I appreciate that you're working to make the weight room updated to fit the quality of the Copeland Fieldhouse. There's no other place like the Copeland Fieldhouse um, in how beautiful it is. So I just think you're doing a great job and the whole Thank program you. is just fabulous. Thank you. And if I could piggyback off of that, we just say for uh, the community members, you you don't have to be a Milton Public School student or a parent to come and enjoy some of these events. It's a small community. Let's not wait until tournament play to support our fans. Let's, let's help them get that ride to the tournament by showing it we can have a home field or home court or home ice advantage. So, again, come out and support the teams. Sheridan and Ms. Padera. Thank you. I want to thank you for that very comprehensive presentation. It was wonderful. And I do want to say that I think, Larry, you um, are a wonderful role model for our student athletes because you present yourself as a professional, you're articulate, you are passionate about what you do, but you also show that you really care about the kids and that's, um, you know, that's so important and it comes through very strongly. So thank you for that. I just want to share one thing I happened to see on the news this weekend. Um, a local community, and I forget what community it was, but they have a new cap. It's called a guardian cap that they wear on top of their helmet, and it's, it's a big red thing. I don't know if you can get it in different colors, but it's called a guardian cap, and you can actually, it's supposed to, you know, help um, el eliminate or, you know, yes, it's, it's hmm. for concussion. So I just didn't know. I, I know I asked you about it and you hadn't heard of it, but it might be something just worth looking into and finding about, out about. I have not heard of that, but we're always looking for ways to keep our student athletes safe. <clears throat> Concussions has been oh, such a big part of sports today. And, and, you know, the tough thing with that is it's not only taking kids off the athletic field, but it's keeping them out of the classroom. That's right. And when that happens, as parents, we're lost with what to do with those kids, whether it's one day or one week or one month, um, when they can't 
be going to uh, school and they can't participate in their academics, they need to stay in a dark room or quiet, whatever it is, it's, it, you're lost. And so any, any opportunity we have to uh, keep our kids safe on the athletic field um, would certainly look into that. Um, Can I just, that's exactly why he's so phenomenal, because he doesn't <laughs> just care about the athletics. You care about, you know, you care about the whole child and the, and the families. And that was Thank you. true. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so my first question is, you talked about expanding possibly some of the sports at the Pierce. I don't know if we're, what kind of sports would that be? Soccer, <laughs> volleyball, are we at liberty to say right now or we're still in the planning process? We have a proposal in place right now for soccer for next fall. Okay. Um, we're thinking about, um, well, Mr. Jett mentioned last year we needed to go down to the middle school level for girls hockey. Uh, a great thing with that waiver about going down to the middle school for the girls hockey, there were 12 eighth graders that played mm -hmm. and 11 are here at the high school. Great. Um, to your question though, uh, we're doing that again with our ski team mm -hmm. and we're doing it as well with swim for eighth graders. Oh, good. So we're <laughs> seeking the middle school seventh and eighth grade skiers and eighth grade swimmers to participate in, on the high school teams. Um, so uh, soccer next fall, boys and girls. Uh, we're thinking about baseball and or softball in the springtime. And um, we have the swim in the winter. And we're thinking, uh, I, I met with Dr. Spaulding earlier today about the swim piece and possibly a swim activity to be a grassroots program for the high school swim team. Hopefully they go varsity next year. Um, if we have gym space in time, I would welcome the opportunity to have volleyball be part of that. So is that um, a difficulty with the volleyball, the gym space? It's gym space and, um, you know, the basketball is during that same season if it will be a winter sport. What if um, it was fall? <laughs> I'm just saying, vol well, volleyball is one of those sports that you don't see a lot of, like, cross-country. We're, the kids we're in the process of looking at that. You are? Thank you, Mr. Jett. <laughs> no guarantees. <laughs> You know, I, I, one of our concerns in speaking with Dr. Spaulding today is we, we have a very successful middle school cross country yep. program. And this year in particular, we entered them into a league on the South Shore. Mm -hmm. And we had some very good runners that fin our girls program finished uh, fourth out of 12. Our boys finished sixth out of 12. And some of our top female runners were some of the top runners in that whole league. Mm -hmm. uh, one of our concerns with um, having too many sports <coughs> is we would be taking away from where we really have our success. Um, so if the numbers are great and the talent is great within a certain sport, we don't want to take away from that. Mm -hmm. But we certainly open, you know, to uh, any, any opportunity. Soccer is a popular sport. And if, right. we, could, if we could kind uh, increase the numbers and um, the participation at the middle school level, it's only going to improve at the high school level. Well, I appreciate your efforts on, on all of those sports. Um, and then just one last thing. I don't think you mentioned it, but I, I just wanted to mention it as an example of something I think that is really great at getting to these younger kids. For an example, I believe your high school cross-country team is doing a trail run this weekend. Are they not for very young kids? It's for actually, uh, I'm sorry, the week, uh, not this coming weekend. The, um, the following was, weekend, it's it on Sunday weekend? the... Okay. No, it is this weekend. It's this weekend. Sunday the think, 16th. Yeah. You're right. This month is flying by. Sunday the 16th over at Glover School in Turner's Pond. Um, I believe three different age groups or grade groups. Uh, Starting in first grade. First and second grade, third and fourth, and fifth and sixth. Correct. No, I believe it's six through eight. <laughs> I can tell you everything. But, but you're doing a great job. But anyways, I love that that example. Of <laughs> what does Padera do the rest of the presentation? <laughs> I do think it's great, a great idea to have these older kids in high school bring their sport and share a love of their sport with younger kids. It could be like just that that kind of gets them into it. And so I'm just highlighting that as an example. And I, I just think that's a wonderful idea. I wish I had more Coach Shaw's. He does a great job with his um, cross-country indoor and outdoor track, and this is just another example how he reaches out to the community to try to get more involved. Absolutely. Ms. Kelly? Thank you very much for all this information. I have um, a question and a comment. 
The question is, so, so the, the most of the data that you've provided is around participation. Mm -hmm. So do we have a goal for participation so that we sort of have something we're striving for, or we just want to make it as accessible to everyone possible? I'm, I'm trying to figure out when, when just like everything else that we're trying to do, being data driven and you have a lot of data in here, what are we trying to hit? It's funny that you asked that because uh, coming out here doing this presentation, I was saying to Larry, I wonder what the goal will be because participation, if you look at our fall sports, we were pretty much to the max. We could have added two students to the golf team, but again, you had to have golf clubs and all of that to increase it from 10 to 12. We could have added more students to football or more students to the track team, but if you increase that, by 10%, you're talking about adding 42.5 students or 42 or 43 students to the team. And if you do that, then you're going to have to increase maybe coaching staff as well. So, again, it's, it's what is the goal? Our goal is to make sure that as many students as possible have the opportunity to try out. We want to increase the tryout participation. To uh, committee member Padera's point, if students don't make it, if we know that there's a large interest, maybe we could then justify for doing like an intramural or something like that and building it. But it's hard to ask for those monies to set it up if we don't know if there's an interest. So our goal is to try to, A, make sure more sports are accessible. Hopefully we have a diverse population in all ath athletics that reflects the diverse population in the town and then also providing something for students if they don't make the team. And so that brings me to my next point. So I have three guys, um, one athletics all the way, you know, three sports a year. One did one sport, I think a couple years, and another did no sports. And so I guess, you know, say we have 420 kids of, of the population that play a sport every semester. There's a whole bunch of other people that I think, and I think this ties in with hopefully where our physical education is going, that need to create habits, daily habits, that can provide them with physical fitness throughout their lives. And I think it's wonderful that you're working on upgrading the equipment in the cardio in the, in the weight room. Um, but as a, a parent of a child who would have liked to use it but wasn't involved in a sport, there was no time that at least that he understood that he could go and use that but that would have been a great place to start creating those habits and granted limited space limited resources etc but thinking about the remaining um, population at the high school and how we can include them in physical activity not necessarily a sport because some people get really intimidated by sports but what kinds of things maybe it is an intramural something maybe it's a zumba class maybe, i'm not sure and granted again all of those things take additional resources but there's a whole bunch of of um, people that we need to reach in just in terms of physical fitness i agree with you and um to some extent but i will disagree in the extent that it, it's only sports teams that utilize the weight room. Mr. Medora, Coach Medora, Teacher Medora, he has students in there on various days of the week working out. Some of those students are not on an athletic team. They go in there to work out. Uh, so I think that's a great thing. But to your point, it's also providing extra, other extracurricular activities, whether it's the arts, the performing arts. Or I mean, you look on the uh, balcony, you have some donated uh, ping pong tables that Ted Randall sets up for free, right. and he has a ping pong tournament on uh, some Thursday afternoons. Um, so again, there's a lot that we have to do be a better job of promoting to the public. You really get a lot at Milton High School in terms of some uh, extracurricular activities. Without a doubt, and, and again, I wasn't saying that we weren't. Uh, with regard to the weight room, just right. again, it's one of those things where, um, uh, unless you go in in an unintimidating environment, it's just like the reason that some of the the private clubs have only women and all that kind of stuff. It, it's just creating opportunities for kids who maybe never have used a piece of that equipment right. to come in, not in an environment where they see all the guys lifting or whatever, but something that, you know, just an opportunity to start using it and see if it's something that they can start creating some lifelong habits. That's the only I thing. I agree with you. In <clears throat> In uh, starting this fundraiser for improving the weight room facility, it's just not our teams and student athletes that are using it. Um, PE health classes are um, uh, mandatory for all students 9 through 12. 
and part of those units are to use the weight room and cardio room and have them be, um, have the weight room and cardio room be more accepting of all students, not just our athletes that are going to go in there and use them before the school day or at the end of the school day or to improve on the athletic team. So we want that to be more welcoming to all of our students. Um, and we also utilize that for some of our adult education classes uh, that go on in the evening. Um, so uh, absolutely, I agree with you. I want to make a point. You asked about what's our goal with this participation. I don't know if we're going to look back next year and have these numbers be more or less, but what's important to me more than the, the quantity is the quality of sports that we're putting out there in the field, the quality of coaching that our, our teachers and coaches, coaches are providing, and the quality of the experience that our kids are getting from our coaches. And if the, if the numbers increase, great. But if we're um, educating our kids on the athletic fields in a way that complements what goes on in the classroom, and we can prepare our kids to possibly play college sports, but more importantly, to be um, productive people in society, live in healthy lifestyles, uh, and be in positive role <coughs> models in the community, uh, that's more important to me, and that's a real important goal. <coughs> May I, to Mrs. Kelly's point, um, the way uh, Larry Rooney sold me on this fundraiser, because the fundraisers before supplement the school budget and the fees. So the way Larry sold me on this fundraiser was, one, it's going to enable our students to be more competitive, and he showed me films of other uh, weight rooms and other districts. But more than that, he said that this will make the weight room part, didn't you, of the physical education classes where it's not now. To Mrs. Kelly's point, mm -hmm. you said that the weight room will become an integral part of the other 50 or 60 or 40 percent of students at Milton High School. Yeah. And so that's because for us, philosophically, that's a lot of money that when fundraising usually goes into the pie that we saw up on the screen. That was a nice job, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you again for the opportunity. Thanks. We'll see you at some games. Thank you, Larry. Thank Absolutely. You, James. So um, we have some parents in the audience that are waiting for a particular agenda item, and it's 935. So I'm going to rearrange the agenda a bit. So we're going to do transportation and traffic safety subcommittee update. Then we're going to do finance subcommittee, and then we'll come back to um, C under the superintendent's report. Sounds good. So in um, introducing the transportation and traffic safety subcommittee idea last meeting, uh, Vice Chair Zulis alluded to the fact that there were uh, a number of parents that sensitized us to um, some of these issues and in fact uh, led us to the conclusion that uh, the formation of a transportation and traffic safety subcommittee was one action we should take and we did. So um, it's only been a week but Kristen anything to report yet in, in terms of first steps? Well Glenn, Mike and I briefly talked and had a meeting. Um, you're looking at me blankly. We did talk. No, right? no, I'm, just no I'm, not, I'm, okay. I'm trying not to look blankly. We did blankly. talk <laughs> and <laughs> figure out that we wanted to be able to, sorry, yeah, it's <laughs> late. What can I say? It's late. Um, to, like, we, we brainstormed some um, agenda items of things we wanted to focus on, but the ha we have to get other people involved, and that was our uh, <coughs> next sticking point. So yeah. how do we go about, you know, is it like we've done in the past with the PTO folks? Uh, is there a community member on it? Um, is there a representative of this group? Or are they from the So those are sort of the logistical things we got caught up in. Okay. Right, and I think um, meeting time will be important because we'll yep. need to get the traffic commission and right. um, Jake, who's the transportation director, has a teaching right. schedule. So. Right. So I can follow up with Mike, and Glenn's going to be there as the school representative, right? Is that, that right? Was, I think that was yes, designated. That's, that's yes, that's Yes, so Glenn's designated. So we'll come out with the time, and then Mary can help us get that word out um, to people. Great. 
and we may not be able to get the traffic commission to be part of it, but we're certainly no, going to no, go be at with some them. point, right? Yes. Okay. Police department, just, traffic commission. That's right. We're going to go to all those people right. and talk to them. And when when Mike and I met with um, parents, uh, there were a number of things they talked about that I just like to put okay. on the agenda. Um, crossing guard deployment. Sidewalks plowed in the winter. Yep. Um, and on the deployment of buses, whether we might need more expertise so that we can get better utilization, number of riders on the bus, are the routes, the, the optimized routes, or would it make sense to do different routes and we'd have fewer buses, more buses? So those are some of the things we talked about that I thought were important. Yep, we, yeah, we did have the sidewalks because, <coughs> like, on my side of town now, on Pleasant Street, they're all plowed. I started plowing them, and the neighbors said, why are you plowing them? The town does. I'm like, what? So, because it's a safety issue for the kids walking mm -hmm. to Cunningham Collicott, uh, the crosswalks that are the worst, those have to really be identified because there's different opinions about which ones are the worst. Right. Um, so, also working with the town master plan because there is going to be a lot of um, construction, and so how is the safety, which is already bad, now going to be impacted even more? Um, I think that's all that I thought we came up with a long list of good things that we wanted to talk about in terms of solutions. Great. Ms. Padera? Can I just add one thing to the list I'm thinking sure. about right now, which would be the um, um, that came up was the notification on bus lines, sometimes due to weather or a bus breakdown of telling parents, like, when a bus route's affected, so they know when they're waiting for a bus or when their child's going to be late coming home from a bus. I think we, in years past, we've had a better notification system about that and um, maybe looking at that, how we notify parents and even adding like cell phone notifications, you know, if they want a special number for transportation to be notified, a lot of parents are on their way home or out somewhere with their cell phone or they're at the bus stop with their cell phone. So if we can look at a notification system for students there riding the bus would be great. Yeah. Mr. Zulus. So, so just to, um, to uh, piggyback on what Kristen said, I think the next step is to get the um, committee constituted or get the uh, people on the committee. And we have Kristen and myself and Glenn, who's a, the uh, assistant superintendent of business, we have the transportation director for the, the schools who's on the committee. And then what we voted was one parent from each elementary school and one parent from Pierce to be appointed by the respective PTO's presidents. Right. And so I think the next step may be to reach out to the PTO presidents to get that process moving. And that's, that's what we, that was, we, we, we had this discussion last yeah. Uh, Wednesday in our meeting yep. so and, and so Mary would do that right Mary well I think the most effective way maybe an email from the two school committee members and we could send it out on your behalf um, and letting them know and giving them perhaps a deadline uh, so they can communicate with their parents okay I have a PTO meeting that you can come to and further discuss it with PTO presidents and then they bring the message back very skillfully to their PTOs. Great. So Mike, you and I can talk about that and set that up? Okay. Great. Okay. <clears throat> Finance subcommittee. <coughs> Did we want to go right to the fee schedule? Let's no, go. let's do the warrant first. Okay. So <coughs> the uh, warrant that needs approval tonight is warrant number 20. It's dated November 13th, which is this week, uh, in the amount of $548,639.76. I would move approval of warrant 20 in the amount just described by <laughs> Dr. Pavlicek, because I didn't get all the details. Second. Moved by Ms. Kelly, seconded by Mr. Zulis. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Abstained? 402. Thank you. Um, next item is the recommended fee schedule 
for fiscal year 16. Pavlicek, do you want to just highlight um, the recommended changes? Because most of them are staying the same. The um, fee schedule lists uh, very few changes. Um, with regard to the buses, the, um, it still has the 375 uh, per student, 900 family cap, um, and it indicates that the uh, East Milton shuttle rate would be discontinued this year. That was the uh, recommendation last passed at the Finance Subcommittee. The only other changes in it, are there is a marginal increase um, in mu uh, music lesson fees, $1.00. Um, uh, per lesson fees there um, the on, on the rentals of the facilities um, the custodian food service tech support staff fees have been incremented by two percent or so to uh, reflect the, the increased cost of, of those positions on the short-term rental um, there's a minor change of ten dollars in the rental of the Pierce gym um, and of the elementary gyms um, and uh, and for outside rentals is a change in uh, elementary gyms and classrooms as well so they, they're highlighted in yellow if you have the version from your uh, uh, from your packet um, anything not in yellow is not changed so these are the from discussions with either our rental coordinator our community schools is not recommending any changes. Our uh, adult ed is not recommending any changes. Uh, the preschool is not changed in here. We will, uh, kindergarten, there's no uh, change uh, listed in the uh, full day kindergarten fee. We'll probably revisit that in the spring, depending on what the status of uh, tuition, um, whether the grant is still available or what. But um, at this point, it would look, I would, um, suspect there would be no change in that um, as well so it's just a matter of uh, several of the rental fees and the the issue of the buses so I would move approval of the recommended fee changes I guess as presented on the FY 16 fee schedule dated 1028 with the changes highlighted in yellow um, with the exception of um, the East Milton shuttle is not highlighted, but that's being recommended to be discontinued. Moved by Ms. Kelly. Second. Seconded by Mr. Zulis. Discussion? Ms. Padera? Um, I'd like to move to divide the question to take the bus fee vote separately. Okay. I mean, I guess that would be a friend asking for a friendly it, amendment asked, to my motion, correct. which if the committee's in agreement, I have no problem with that. Okay. So then the first motion would be um, all the fee recommendations with the exception of the East Milton shuttle change. Second. Just a point of clarification. Is it all of transportation, Becky, that you want to take out or is it just the East Milton shuttle? No, all transportation. Right. Oh, all transportation. Sorry. That is only easy. It's all transportation. The bus fees. So moved by Ms. Kelly. This is all fees except transportation seconded by Mr. Zulis. Um, all in favor? It's unanimous on the transportation fees i'll move uh, as recommended on moved by, by the Ms. Kelly, seconded by second mr zulis all in favor well, oh. discussion discussion <laughs> i'd like to um amend the motion to make the individual fee 325 and the family cap 750. Um, you accept that as a friendly amendment? I, I do not, no. And we'll have to vote on the motion first. 
and just as. Thank you. Yes. Um. Well, the thing is, is if if this motion wins, then there's really no opportunity to open that. So, That's if you'd true. like to explain um, why you would want to be doing that. So here's the thing: we're raising the, um, we're eliminating the East Milton shuttle, but we're in effect raising the bus fee for 10 percent of our riders, about 70 percent if it's 375. And so my understanding is, looking at the background that Mr. Pavlicek has done, um, <coughs> our fees are relatively high in comparison to other communities. Um, this is an opportunity, in my mind, if we're raising that fee, the collection amount raised is about 23000 So lowering the fee to everybody to, three, to 325 is really an equal. The money's, we're raising 23%, 23000 more. But where is that money going? We're just collecting that much more in fees. So the cost of this, and Mr. Pavlicek can correct me if I'm wrong, sounds to be about 4000 for the individual fee or 2, 000, and 2000 for the family cap after you take out the increased fees for the other folks that fee was lower. And I don't think that's a huge amount of cost for what we're doing because it's a huge increase for those people. and. The other folks are paying a higher fee than looks like other communities, so I just think it's fair. Our family cap in especially is very high in comparison to other communities, so I just think it's a fair amount for what we're looking at because we are raising the fee on some. Um, and fair enough, if we're all agreed with paying the same rate with everybody, I just think we need to equalize that across. If we're, a lot of people are paying a lot more, then why can't the fee be a little bit lower in general? In addition to that, just to add, we might, that doesn't necessarily mean that's the numbers if the ridership stays the same, but we might get increased riders in some other parts of town because their fee is lower. So our revenues might be the same. We can always reevaluate next year and see what that fee did. If we've looked at a lot of people increased it in this area or this area, I do think there's, speaking as an elementary parent, there's a lot of drivers coming to these elementary schools and anything we can do to either maintain the ridership on the buses we have or even increase it in some areas would be beneficial on the safety side of things. So that's my seven cents. Sure. Sorry. Could, Mr. Pavlicek, could you please clarify the point that um, Mrs. Padero was just making? Is that, do you think it will somewhat be at a break even if we lower the price but equalize it for everybody? And because to go from $225 up to three hundred and seventy-five dollars is a big jump. So if we if we reduce it to three twenty-five, equalize it a little. Based bit. on current ridership, um, and I don't have the full details of it, but I know how many people ride each bus. I know how many people pay and how many people don't pay. Um, two of the buses cross into East Milton, so some people are maybe paying two twenty-five and some people pay three seventy-five. But I'll. Um, I made an adjustment there. I actually have a little spreadsheet that figures out based what, what works for the um, the different uh, fees. If uh, just on the matter without adjusting the family cap of um, equalizing all the fees at three three twenty five, I estimate it's about a four thousand dollar loss in in revenue. From about 178,000 to about 174,000 in bus fees. Did you, sorry, did you say that's without lowering the family cap? That's without lowering the family cap. Lowering the family cap has less of an effect because very few people are at the $900. Um, if you lower it to 750, you're only you're probably only affecting 10 families. Mm -hmm. um, so it's only a couple of thousand dollars more. So I think an estimate of six to seven thousand dollars loss of revenue by changing this is a good estimate. Thank you. <clears throat> Can I ask a question? $6,000 total or $6,000 bus? Total. The difference. Total is 6000 that we would lose if everybody went to 325 Yes. Thank you. And we lowered the cap from 900 to 750 
one comment I have, that's okay. I do think that it's really important that our rate is equalized. Um, I, you know, it's got to be the same for everybody, one way or the other. I mean, this seems like it could be a good compromise. Um, it might not be able to last because we can't, you know, but for $6,000, I could certainly live with it and see um, how that works. Um, the issue with the other thing that's come up is whether people can, can pay in installments, and I know that would be a nightmare, but that would be they something. Can. They can't. They can. They can? Oh, somebody asked me why they couldn't. I said I don't know. They, they, we have, they can We have pay. made arrangements to pay in Thank installments you. for so something. That's, that makes me feel better. Two or three, too. but it's yeah, yeah. No, but just not, so the not people, weekly, but, yeah. people know that. And then um, the other thing, and maybe it's just a little thing, but we have to have some agreement over which towns we compare ourselves to because I saw lots of towns that Glenn presented that we paid less. Then other people come in and say, no, we pay. We have a certain amount of towns that we tend to compare ourselves to, so I'd like to see us agree on, you know, those are the 10 towns we use for various reasons. I think that's important because there's a whole bunch of towns being thrown out there and <clears throat> we have to compare our bus fees to those towns just like we compare everything else to. Um, and I had another point, but I'm tired, so I forgot it. Uh, come back to me. Mary, are you going to raise your hand? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, unfortunately, we have fees all over the place. Um, I think I've always been a proponent that the more money out of our general fund that we spend on transportation is money that we are not spending on a teacher in the classroom. We're going into a budgetary season that we don't have any overrides on the horizon, at least not that I've heard, and it's going to be a difficult budgetary year. So if it came down to um, decreasing the fee versus saving a teacher, or even half a teacher for that matter, my vote would be saving the teacher. So I am still in, in favor, although I understand all the concerns. I know it's a big jump. Every family needs to make decisions. I think that's one of the reasons why we wanted to have this discussion early in the year so families could make plans for next year. And I think the safety concerns are a huge <coughs> issue, and I think we're going to address that going forward with the subcommittee and working with the police department and others. So um, I am still in favor of the motion that's on the on the table, which is to um, increase the rates to the present rates that are in there, three seventy-five <coughs> and nine hundred. Michael first. So it sounds like we're all in agreement that um, we need to take steps on the safety issue. It sounds like we're all in agreement that everyone should pay the same amount for the same service. Um, so then the question is, what's the right rate? What are the right fees? Um, and um, from what Glenn provided to us, the rate went to 350 with an 850 cap in 2007, seven years ago, and increased by $25 three years ago. So um, if the rate's too high, it's been too high for a long time. I don't know whether it's too high. Um, it seems to me that you could, there are, you, you could go a lot of different ways in the, in the research or the, the comparable communities. There's certainly a lot of other variables um, in, that each community has to look at when it's setting, it fee, it's setting its fees. Um, so it's hard to do an apples to apples comparison with other communities because we look at a lot of different variables and they have their, they have their interests and they have their concerns and we have our interests and our concerns. Um, I um, don't see a compelling reason to dramatically, to drop the rate given that it's been in that range for the last seven years and the administration is recommending that it stays the same. Um, I tend to look to the administration as the experts in this and what it should be. Um, and certainly in, in this town in the last five years, um, we've had a lot of rigorous um, review and decision making of budgets, not only on this committee, but across town. Um, and it just strikes me that um, to 
drop the rate for for the reason it's a legitimate reason that it's these are difficult difficult things to it's difficult to raise the rate by that level for certain amount of the families in Milton to make it equal um, but it seems to me that that would be a departure from what we've been doing across town over the last five years certainly since I've been involved and certainly on this committee for the last couple of years the kind of rigorous um, budgetary decision making that we've been going through and so I don't see a compelling reason to depart from the from the the um, the uh, recommendation of the administration on this so I would just say that um, I do think there's compelling reasons if you just go to a lot of our elementary schools where there are too many people driving to school and I do think that the last time we raised the rate our revenue actually went down so raise, raising the rate for all of these people, which is what we're doing and collecting more revenue, doesn't mean that we're necessarily going to get more revenue. We could get less. We could get more revenue from lowering the rate for everyone. And I think $6,000 is a very low amount as a good compromise to look and see where that takes us. If we get reduced traffic at our elementary schools and our revenues are the same or even up, then we'll know what that rate does. Because it sounds like a small amount but a $50 can make a big deal, a difference for families, and a family cap of 750 instead of 900 can make a big difference. Once, a lot of parents from who I've talked to, once they have one student go, that's fine. Then the next student comes along and it's just too much. They can drive for the same amount of difficulty and drive two students is much cheaper than one. So I do think it's a compelling reason and I think that of course, every dollar is important in our budgetary process, but I think safety and getting kids to school on time um, is important too. And this is something we can continue to reassess every year. It's not a huge um, hit we're taking with the transportation fees. It's just looking at we're raising the fee 70 percent with 375 with some of these parents, and I think this is a good compromise to look at. So. I would just say that's what I have to weigh in on the fees, and I, you know, that's why I think that way. Ms. Kelly? So um, I'm a little concerned that you're describing um, parents driving to school as a safety issue, and so this is really, I think you've mentioned it before, and I'd like to have more specifics because I'm not aware of any of this. And um, if the administration believes that we have safety issues because we have too many families driving to schools, um, I think certainly it should be put on the subcommittee a, a, yeah, as absolutely. an issue. Um, but I, I guess I'm, I'm trying to understand. It's one thing to get to school on time, and that's, you know, a, a, a whole other issue, I think, um, not the same as safety. Well, <coughs> I think that the, the point is that when you have too many people driving, that a lot of our schools are not built for having driver's lines that extend in certain areas or people parking along streets that are neighborhood streets and when you get too many people parked in places especially in the winter you have kids crossing and causing safety situations that's all i mean there's not like people driving and driving over you know um getting in tr it's just additional traffic at schools where kids are walking kids are biking it just causes additional congestion which can lead to safety issues it could just deal with congestion as well so that's my point I would want to make clear that we kept keep the safety separate from the fees even right. though I think you raise a good point so sorry Linda Lee I didn't mean to sure <clears throat> sorry I think I'm losing my voice as the night goes on um, so I I do feel strongly that we need to equalize the the fees and um, it does seem like a large, large jump from $225 to $375 for some families to go and uh, to pay an additional $150 this year. So, I mean, I would be even in favor of equalizing it and staying at $350. I don't want, want to muddy the water, but I just, I think in all fairness that that, that is a very large leap to make with families to, to you know, they've been used to paying $225, and now they're going to have to pay $375 um, per, per child per bus. So um, 
that would be my rationale really for um, lowering or at least maintaining what we currently charge for our buses um, across across the town so and I mean I I did feel strongly about the nine hundred dollars and the fact that Glenn um, said that it only impacted around 10 families um, again you know to to lower it to 750 or even 800 you know I mean it's just if we're if we're willing to go down a little bit um, I think that every you know every hundred dollars is a lot of money to our families and um, to to charge the combination between charging another hundred and um, fifty dollars plus the, the cap is seems like a lot to me so I'm not sold uh, I'm not um, totally locked into Becky's numbers but I but I absolutely think that um, coming down is a so what numbers are you suggest I'm sorry no I mean I, I think we should vote uh, what I'm not gonna tell sorry <laughs> oh well we have a motion on the floor right. that we have to vote we don't have to vote on the amendment. It wasn't accepted as a friendly amendment. But I need an amendment. That's after the motion was made. So we have to vote on the motion. Then if that fails, then we can listen can to Can you explain? Amendment. I couldn't hear you. It's hard. Uh, it is we have hard a motion on the floor that we have to vote. If that motion fails, then we can hear Becky's amendment and vote on that. Mm. Yeah. Glenn seems to. She moved to amend the motion on the floor. Wasn't accepted as a accepted friendly amendment. No, but she, she just needs a second, and then it becomes a. She doesn't have to be friendly. Did, did I second it. Because then it becomes the prevailing motion. It's a move to sec. It's a move to uh, amend. If you vote the amendment, and if it fails, you go back to the original. Did somebody second it though? I don't think anybody did. Just now or before? Okay, according to our parliamentarian. <laughs> <laughs> he is our parliamentarian. So, do um, you want to state what your motion is? Yeah, my motion is to amend the um, fee for one student for transportation, 325, and the family math to 750. Okay. On the motion to amend, which is to reduce the uh, individual fee per student fee to three three twenty five and the family cap to seven fifty. Any further discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion fails. Now we're back to the original motion which is to accept the superintendent's recommendation for fiscal 16 transportation fees. All in favor? Oh, can we have a discussion? Oh, I thought we had discussion. On it, <clears throat> well, now it's changed yes. because the, sorry. So I would like to make a friendly motion that, um, that we adapt it to $350 across the board rather than um, the 375 that's proposed. Second. I don't have to second it, right? Well, no, if, if right. someone has to. Oh, well, then I second it. If it's not accepted as a friendly amendment. Yeah, oh. No, <laughs> I, I'm not accepting Not accepted as a friendly amendment. So on the motion to amend the individual fee to 350, do you have a um, motion on the family cap? Um, can we take them separately? <laughs> sure. Can you uh, say it again? Just, I'm sorry. You're losing your voice. So I know. I really. I'm am. losing my hearing. So. Um, it's, th so my motion is to equalize the um, bus fees per child um, and make it $350 per child. So we're not increasing up to 375, and we're increasing the. Um, we're, we're maintaining what it was for some students, and we are raising it. Um, hundred and twenty five dollars for others. Mr. Zulis? Can I just seek a clarification? I don't think anyone's trying to raise the fees this year. I think it's three seventy five now and no one's trying to raise it. It's not three fifty now as I understood. I could be wrong, but no. I thought it was three seventy five now. It's three seventy five. It's three seventy five across. Right. It's three seventy five across the board. So nobody's talking oh, about I'm raising sorry. it, I think. 
Right. So I'm just trying to make it so that East Milton isn't paying so much right. more, and 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 by making them all 350, it's right. So lower the rate. Lower it from 375 to 350. Exactly. Sorry. Can you say that? Can it? Somebody so everyone will pay three hundred and fifty dollars. Is that that's your motion? Bus fee. So second. Okay. On the motion to make the per student fee for fiscal sixteen three hundred and fifty dollars. All in favor? I couldn't hear you, Lori. <laughs> the motion to make the individual fee three hundred and fifty dollars. All in favor. Opposed. The motion <coughs> does not carry. So, <laughs> so, what happens from here? Back to the original motion. Well, back to the original motion, if you want, which is still That's on the correct. table. It's on the table. Any discussion on the original motion? Ms. Sheridan. Um, motion to amend the family cap in the original motion down from 900 to $750. Do we need a second? second. Yes. Second. Okay. On the motion to amend the family cap. So is it just that, or it's the whole? Well, I thought you wanted to take them. No, separate. now I'm okay with taking it separate because we've gotten to a place where there are no options. But okay. So that would, so what we're talking about is, 375 individual and 750 for our family cap, correct? That's correct. So we're voting on the amendment. Right. Yes, the the amendment is 375 per student and 750 for a family cap. Well, 375 is not an amendment. Right, just a 750. Right, just a 750 is an Correct. amendment. Correct. Sorry. Okay. Sure. Is everyone clear on that? Yes. 375 per student, 750 family cap. On that motion, all in favor? Opposed? That does not carry. Wow. So, on the original motion, if, unless there are any other ideas, on the original motion, which is the superintendent's original recommendation, 375, $900 family cap. All in favor? Opposed? Does not carry. We're nowhere, ladies and <laughs> gentlemen. <laughs> Using all your parliamentary rules tonight. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Can we look to the administration to give us some guidance around this? Or is the 375, <laughs> <laughs> is the 375 the best <laughs> guidance that um, you guys can come up with? Lots of documents. There is what, Ms. one other Ms. option. Go ahead. What's the other option? And, and we've talked about it previously, and that was to go in steps over a two year process. Yeah. I I thought that might be a good idea. I don't think it's a good idea anymore. So I'm not prepared to make that motion. You're well, not. I guess the question is, do any of the other members, is that amenable? Because the issue is that we would be looking out beyond one year in this scenario. And, and the scenario would be that you, for next year, for those that were participating in the East Milton Shuttle, their increase would be halfway to the 375 and then the following year it would be to equalize to whatever that rate is that has been floated so my only problem with that is one of the things that i thought was an incentive of lowering the fee for everyone is that it was fair to have everyone have a lower some people would have a lower rate some people were paying a lot more than they had previously but the full fact was we were equalizing the rate and then we could look at whether that lower rate in some areas would actually bring in more riders so you know I can certainly look at that option in terms of compromise but I just think it's 
it's just a better avenue to do. We're talking about six thousand dollars, and we can look at and reevaluate after last next year, and say, oh wow, like the ridership did go up here, or it didn't. This didn't work at all, and maybe and we're not making enough revenue, you know. So that's my point. But go yeah. ahead. I think part of the problem is I think we're analyzing data without enough data yeah. points, right? So there's assumptions being made that when we raise the rate at one point, that ridership went down. Right. We don't have any data to prove that, right. except that just there was an in, you know a total number of collections yeah. that was less than a previous year. But then I think it went up after that, yeah. and, and so um, fr from that perspective, and I guess from that perspective, going into what I believe will be a tough budgetary year, I think we're going to be looking for every penny we can save. And again, this is why I say when it comes to a transportation dollar versus a teacher, there is no choice for me. It's always going to be the teacher. And so um, what's being suggested, because part of your, I think, desire, a big driver of your desire to lower the rate is to make it not so impactful to those families who are going to be impacted. So I guess what I'm proposing, and again, I'm not going to make the motion somebody else can if you think it's something that we could, we could uh, take up, but um, to just for East Milton shuttle families right now for them to get a, some increase next week next year and then after that to equalize to whatever the, the going rate is um, for the following year well I'm just gonna put out there though that I do think we're we're equalizing the rate but we're telling those families that are already paying 375 which some of those people had really good points is like why am I paying 375 I'm living on a very dangerous street so we're raising the rate with other people, but we're not, we're not, we're just, we're just collecting 23,000 more in revenue. And there should be a savings for someone if right, we're raising but the rate. You don't on know that that's going to happen. Those, some of those families may decide they can't afford the rate well, and that, they're not, they're going to the, drive. There's, there's another assumption, right? We don't know that. It, exactly. And, and I think that's why we're, this is a, a very tough place to be. It is. So if no one else wants to make that dual year uh, steps motion then I think we're at least I think we're stuck well um, Ms. Sheridan why don't you move to reopen on the motion you made I can't hear which one I made a few <laughs> we can't hear you, you down here it's really closer hard to, to you we can't really why don't, Ms. Sheridan why don't you move to reopen you have there has to be one of the people that voted in the affirmative on your motion 375 and 750 dollar family cap no well you're just hmm? choosing a motion <laughs> which I'm now prepared to support. Okay. Well, then I'll reopen on lowering the student rate to 350 and lowering the family max to 750. Second. Um, so that's motion different. Motion has to be reconsidered by someone on the prevailing side. Correct. Which she was. Prevail. I was on the oh, I'm sorry. She wasn't on no, the prevailing side. None of them. You're right. None of them prevailed. Oh, none of them prevailed. None of them. But prevailed. so she's making but, but a new someone motion. Voted against someone it. Someone voted against to, it. Oh. Has to move reconsideration. I then I move that we <laughs> Ms. Sheridan's motion for 375 and a 750 dollar family cap. Second. So this is on the motion to reopen or reconsider. All in favor? Wait, so it's I have three. A question. <laughs> just reopening. We just oh, motion to, re re to, 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 to reopen. To, to reconsider. reconsider. To reconsider the previous vote. Mm -hmm. God, you're here, Glenn. <laughs> so, on the motion to reconsider, all in favor? Oh, it's unanimous. Okay. <laughs> on, the, on the motion itself. Make a motion to discussion? adjourn. No, sorry. <laughs> Second. Any discussion? Uh, could you say it again, please? On the motion to, on the, now, the motion itself, any okay. discussion? So this motion is $375. And a with a family cap family of 350 750 What did I say? 350 Oh, sorry. So, so. Mr. Zulis? So we're reducing, we would be reducing the family cap from 900 to 750 um, and Glenn, what do you think the financial impact of that would be? What's the estimate? Probably, probably in the neighborhood of two thousand dollars. Thousand dollars. Small. And and the ration. I'm sorry. Um, uh, the rationale for doing that. Um, 
for um, when we have to go to other town boards, i.e. the Warren Committee, and we're asked about reducing fees. Uh, the rationale for that is? The impact is $2,000, and we needed some consensus on uh, an issue that was difficult to reach consensus on. It's tough having a six-member board. Yes, it is. <laughs> Maybe we should wait till next meeting. Okay. Can I ask a question? Um, Can you elect a seventh? Except it's no. sure. 10, 15, so who knows how coherent I'll be. Um, I know that you said that we have a payment plan and we have all that. Is there a way to formalize or publicize the fact that there is a payment plan, what it looks like, how you get it, that there is a way to request for a deduction. I know with the sports, if you're free and reduced lunch, yes, but if your parent gets laid off or if something happens with your house, you don't meet that free and reduced lunch, but you really, things are pretty tight. So they'll work with families around that on, you know, whatever. Could we do something like that to say more of if this is a financial hardship, which I know it is from, from me, um, that there would be a way, this is how you apply, this is how you can get a deduction? The process has been, you know, it, it's, it hasn't been widely publicized, but if someone calls up and says they have an issue, we make every, you know, as with the athletics, we make every effort to, to work okay. with the families. I mean, that's been going on for a number right. of years, back but to the previous, you know, uh, there's, we don't have a yeah. application form or anything like that. But if someone comes up and said, "I want my kids to ride the bus, but I can't make the payments," can you can we work something out? We do. But are you asking us part of this motion? Can the administration yes. be more proactive yes. in terms of publicizing yes. that availability? That, that there is a process that you could do, just like with athletics, the coaches and the teachers are also pushing for kids to go because kids or the families aren't going to ask for the lower fees so coaches and teachers say to kids you need to you, this is okay to do so how could we make that more accessible to families so that families who really do need it can apply for it in a above board manner not just word mm -hmm. of mouth so whoever the author of this motion is at this point I, I would say that there's a friendly amendment to include some proactivity on the part of the administration to make clear that um, payment plans are an option. So uh, either I'm talking to myself or I'm talking to Ms. Sheridan. Talking to but, okay, so accepted. <laughs> I would just like to go on the record before we take the vote in just saying one more time that I think rising, raising a um, whole portion of our community from $225 to $375 in a year is a lot of money to go up. <coughs> I just want to say it one more time. 70%. Just saying. I agree that it's a lot, um, and I agree that it's very difficult. Um, um, so the, the motion that's on the floor now is to lower the family cap to $100 lower than what was set in 2007. And hundred dollars less than what the family cap was from 2007 through 2013 I guess um, and so my question is does the does in does the does the um, administration have a revised recommendation on that I'd say it doesn't matter if they have a revised recommendation there's a there's a motion on the floor and so, you could, you, we can ask them if they have an opinion. Well, uh, yeah, I totally agree that they, they don't have to have a recommendation, but I'm, I'm asking if they have a recommendation on that. I, I can ask that. They, it doesn't have to be part of the motion. I can ask if they have a recommendation. They may say no. I've always talked about the family cap in terms of uh, in, transport, in um, uh, summer enrichment and athletics, um, the cap seems to be two or uh, right under two children. And so that makes it um, the, that recommendation of 700 parallel 750. to 750 to what it is in summer enrichment and what it is 
in um, sports, so I would do that. But I know what you're saying. All these years it hasn't been that, but the uh, number of families is small, but it would parallel two or 1.8 number of children. Just as a, another added benefit is families whose all their children take the bus, like we have numerous families at the same stops, makes the bus routes shorter from my understanding. So the more people you have making use of those because maybe they'll be able to because they have a family cap that's <coughs> lower. I'm just saying it's it's another benefit sometimes we don't think about. Okay. On the motion. Three seventy five per student, seven hundred fifty dollar family cap. All in favor. Opposed? Five to one. Motion carries. Nicely you've, done. You've reopened. Nicely now done. you have to vote it. What? Oh. You've reconsidered the motion. We no, voted no, to we reconsider did already. We did that, you did we did that, Glenn. Oh, you did? We did. We did. This was 5 to 1. Thank you. So I you rarely say this, Glenn, but you're wrong. Yeah. It's too bad, Mark. It's too bad, But you just amended it, so you have to vote the motion now. You amended what? You reconsidered a motion to amend. You then voted to amend. You have to vote the amended motion. Oh, yeah, that's right. Oh, we amended the motion, now we have to vote on the motion. He's right. No. Yeah, you reconsidered the motion to amend. Yeah. That was the first vote. Then you re-voted no. the motion no. to amend, which no. you did. No, We took a vote to reconsider mm -hmm. a motion. And a motion was made. Yes. So we and voted to reconsider. A, you, you sort of did a friendly amendment to that motion by adding. It was on. my. It was apparently my motion. Correct. So what are we in agreement on yeah, here? Yeah, go, we're, we're in agreement. We? I believe that we. <laughs> I think you're in agreement. Yeah, Glenn. I I think I think the 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 motion the original motion Mary's original motion didn't carry, and then Leroy moved to reconsider. The amendment, and uh, uh, Linda Lee's, Linda Lee's. So I think since that uh, Mary's original motion had been not defeated, but not didn't carry. I think that. Well, you you voted you, the last vote voted to amend because it was a motion to amend. So it amended the original motion, which didn't carry. Right. So now. That's right. That's right. That's right. No, I, I think it's pro forma. I think yeah. we know where we're going, so I'm not too worried about it. So, moving on. <laughs> yes, why don't we? Um, to the FY16 advancement budget. Do we have a slide presentation? Well, we got to get through this. We have to do this tonight. Hmm? We have to do this tonight. All right. Um, yes, because well, no, no, no. Um, uh, we've only got two more meetings in the next three weeks. Uh, Ms. 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 Padera has pointed out that we need to make clear um, that the fees are to apply this to the, the same for all the riot, all the families in town. That that wasn't clear, um, at least in her view of the of the motion. So we may want to make that clear, that 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 fee applies across town. Oh, I I framed it as per student and family cap. How could that not? I think clear? you're right. I just want to make sure that we're all agreed that all agreed with what we did. Here. Down. Uh, we are now going to present uh, the our advancement budget for two, uh, FY 15-16. Very briefly, uh, two years ago, the school committee uh, directed the administration uh, to uh, meet with our administrative staff for them to uh, meet with their teachers, and the charge was how to move the Milton Public Schools ahead. And so we are in the third year of uh, working on this advancement budget. Uh, Glenn, if you could bring me to the next slide. The um, so we start with the vision of the Milton Public School System is to build and strengthen a dynamic community that challenges all students to thrive and achieve. In order to uh, meet that vision, uh, we've come up with this advancement budget, uh, working collaboratively with the Finance Subcommittee 
uh, presenting now to the school committee. We have met several times. We've met with the entire leadership team, all of the uh, curriculum coordinators and the principals. And uh, as of 7 this morning, the finance subcommittee agreed that what our process has been is to uh, present to the school committee tonight to hear your input, uh, to then edit with the finance subcommittee, to go out to every one of the PTOs and other groups in town and um, uh, listen to what uh, the citizens and the parents and guardians have to say. And really, um, this is really a work in action. So the advancement budget initiatives that we originally based on the student data from the district, based on solid research, um, the consensus, again, we sat in this very room, we could have had 19 initiatives, but again, based on research, most importantly, based on state student data, number one, emphasizing early literacy achievement, pre-K through three. The second initiative, closing the achievement gaps, the proficiency gaps where they exist, pre-K through 12. And thirdly, advancing science and STEM, STEM standing for um, <coughs> science, technology, engineering, and math, those initiatives. Again, all students will be taught science, but to have additional STEM classes, kindergarten through grade 12. So based on our data, uh, to move achievement forward, anyone who listens to these uh, site council presentations in the last two years understand that uh, even with the parents, these initiatives, uh, you'll see in the detail of the Glover, of the Tucker, and the Pierce site council plan, they incorporate our core values and our advancement initiatives. Every one of the uh, initiatives or goals that they have um, tap around one of these three initiatives. Moving ahead, just for those new to the process, the first year uh, the school committee recommended going to town, uh, Warren Committee, working collaboratively with them, answering their questions, hearing their feedback, and then going to town meeting. Uh, the advancement budget the first year was $515,000. That was 13-14. The second year, $538,000. And those two uh, plans that we're going to detail and summarize for you have been over the last 18 months um, of hiring staff, materials, professional development, again, bringing you back to targeting those three areas in the Milton Public Schools based on student data to move the system ahead, move achievement ahead. The initiatives were based on research. And again, um, this says the implementation of the entire leadership team. In fact, we work in collaboration with the finance subcommittee and the school committee. And uh, we hear the input and incorporate the input. So this is a collaborative, um, really, recommendation. The implementation. Um, is in year two. Currently, we're in year two. It's very important to understand that as we get into the detail, uh, looking for outcomes in literacy, um, science and STEM, and closing the achievement gaps where they exist in the Milton Public Schools. So that first initiative, emphasizing early literacy achievement. So the research, again, um, this research from 2010 is referred to even in the most current research. Reading is the cornerstone of academic success. And if you open up any Boston newspaper, national journal, national newspaper, they talk about reading um, at grade level by the end of grade three. And my analogy um, to the viewing audience is when you um, uh, break the code at kindergarten, first and second and third grade. Um, then when you're not able to read, uh, the divide, the proficiency gap between those who can read and can't read becomes larger and larger. So the emphasizing, you heard that site council presentation tonight, emphasizing kindergarten and now with a pre-K initiative, first, second and third grade and the correlation between between being able to read and being proficient or advanced in reading in those early grades and later success in school is a direct correlation. And the research 
indicates that 74 percent of children whose reading skills are less than sufficient by third grade have a drastically reduced likelihood of graduating from high school. And again, um, this research is out of Harvard, and as a result, these children are unlikely to develop skills essential for really being contributing members of the, this economy and society. So this early literacy, I can't stress how important um, this initiative is. And so when we went, we're in year two, when we looked at the initial data, uh, the data is consistent among the cohorts, and what this indicates to us as the practitioners is that um, we identified the right area. So in 2012, 2013, and recently in our recent data, 29% um, in 2012 scored below proficient and advanced of our third graders, not reading at grade level, and that number has been has held constant. But I want to explain to the school committee and the viewing public that last year's third graders did not have the benefit of the reading specialists. We targeted those reading specialists at grades one and two. And now this year we have a reading specialist at grade three. So let me take a student. The current grade three student in the Milton Public Schools now has reading support and had reading support last year. So the children that we have tested and those, um, those data points, those children haven't benefited from these early literacy initiatives. The current third graders at the end of this year would have benefited from two years of your early literacy um, staff, text, materials, imply, uh, uh, techniques, uh, excuse me, text, materials, and supplies, and um, assessments. In 2014, just to briefly summarize, again, the first year of these advancement initiatives, um, you heard tonight uh, two reading specialists that provided system-wide in our four elementary schools direct reading service to students in grades one and two. And you heard reference tonight, uh, Ms. Sheridan asked, and Ms. Padera, who is, um, her name, the night is late, Sarah Doherty, Sarah Doherty, um, works in our four schools as a digital education specialist, again, incorporating with our teachers, working with students around uh, digital education. Now she's working on um, the skills K through six, K through five for the PAC implementation. The so we've separated this. What were the personnel purchases that first year? What were the instructional support uh, purchases? You heard tonight about these formative assessments hugely driven by the finance subcommittee and the school committee so that um, uh, remarks uh, a teacher said to me I've never had as much information about a student when I sit down at parent conferences you heard that experienced Tucker teacher say on the first day I know the reading level we're not waiting two weeks three weeks four weeks that teacher knows the reading level at the end of the previous grade for all of the children so these formative assessments are given at grades one and two um, and then they're also given uh, three through seven a different presentation a different night when children um, students still have reading weaknesses reading curriculum materials purchased to support the readers writers workshop servicing students in 2014 in grades one and two you heard the emphasis on reading and writing and how important that is so these were materials that would have been difficult in the Milton public schools to hire across the district for all grades one and two our plan over the years was always to implement a new curriculum in one grade this is what differentiates this advancement initiative all of the materials were bought all of the students in grades one and two were impacted and then very important the professional development to our teachers so that they can take these materials um, Ms. Kelly mentioned this morning at Finance Subcommittee, take these materials and no more is everyone reading the same reader. We're differentiating those students who are excelling, are having reading materials at their level, while students are at an, um, other students are at their instructional level, and other students um, who are diff having difficulty are having materials at their level. So in 2014, under this one um, initiative, those are the instructional supports and the personnel that were hi hired and are in place. 
The early results, the internal reading assessments showed significant growth in grades one and two. In grades one, uh, we're going to um, put these into pie charts per uh, Member Kelly's request, but today we've highlighted in grade one, after putting these internal assessments um, uh, three to four times a year, they almost call it like a blitz, all the reading teachers, all the teachers, all the Title I teachers, every student um, is given one of these internal assessments on a one-to-one -one basis from a teacher. Um, the English one students went up from 68% uh, to in, um, at the beginning of grade one uh, to 86% um, on or above benchmark in June of 2014. So again, those are huge strides moving again benchmark would be grade level and in grade two english students improved from 81 percent on or above benchmark in september two, 2013 to the end of that school year 86 percent on or above benchmark in 2014. so um, when we travel to every school you heard tonight um, we meet with principals they detail the name of every student um, they turn in these results district-wide and um, every child's reading level is tracked through the year, the number of reading levels um, that they advance. And again, based on the, um, their reading levels, that is how we target um, the supports. Early literacy, the current year that we're in, um, we, the school committee voted, the Warren committee worked with us, town meeting voted for an additional reading specialist who now works across the district at grade three. We also hired a parent outreach liaison to work with parents and guardians, and you heard the reference tonight um, about uh, the preschool working with the parent liaison. So again, the research proves when families are engaged in the school, um, achievement improves. We want to reach out to families who aren't involved in the school, who don't go to parent-teacher conferences, who want to add parent activities, who might not have um, uh, the supports at home to support nightly homework, work with these parents, um, give them the supports they need so their partners in the triangle of the school, the child, and the home uh, working towards, again, proficiency and advanced and early literacy reading for all children. The instructional supports, you heard the reference tonight um, about the uh, um, reading uh, rooms and the leveled readers. Again, these were purchases that if it weren't for the advancement budget, these purchases have been bought by PTOs, MFE, but this was an infusion of funds so that you, it was these, this Tucker PTO should have stayed tonight. <coughs> you heard the teacher say, I have the leveled readers in the class now to provide for the levels of all of the children in my classroom. Pre-K uh, text and materials to support that preschool, um, district-wide preschool that you're, you've heard referred to that's housed at the Tucker School. Uh, working with the outreach liaison and again the additional professional development provided to our teachers around readers workshop this year and read it really reading and um, writing among all of our teachers to support them with the professional development so that uh, they they can use these new materials and work with our students again our goal uh, proficient and advanced all students reading at the end of uh, grade three reading at grade level are um, looking at again working with finance subcommittee looking towards next year in the area of early literacy um, you heard uh, I think it was mr. Zulis asked principal uh, McNeil Jermai what would be your um, uh, uh, recommendations moving the advancement budget through next year and the first thing she said was to expand the preschool so we've had deliberations about the preschool and our recommendation is thirty thousand dollars to extend the pilot preschool program the district-wide program to five days a week um, a session every morning and then a session every afternoon so right now it's going to be three ten uh, week sessions uh, three days a week, two hours. We want to move it towards uh, five mornings a week for one group of students, five afternoons a week for another group of students for the entire school year. Um, in the instructional support, um, because we've already 
uh, with the advancement funds for this year, uh, been able to create the classroom. We would look for a $5,000 purchase to expand that program for the uh, really the materials that it would take to ex exponentially expand it from the model that it is now to uh, servicing more children and more time next year. Um, the implementation you heard referenced, you, the Tucker is using their Title I money. Again, this emphasis on early literacy, and if you target the supports in the third grade um, so that all children are reading at grade level, uh, we're asking for $20,000 to really replicate the model that's at the Tucker um, system-wide so that at the Glover Collie Cotton Cunningham, we would identify students who aren't reading at grade level at the beginning, well, really opening it to all children, but really targeting children who aren't reading at grade level and um, bring them in on Saturdays and give them targeted instruction. So at the end of third grade, the goal is all children are reading at grade level. Uh, the next uh, is a $50,000 request to provide professional development opportunities over the summer in early literacy and, bring, and to continue with the consultant that really has the expertise that um, has been working with us in the Reader's Writer's Workshop to assure that every one of our teachers is proficient or advanced in really um, uh, creating an atmosphere where this Reader's Writer's Workshop can flourish and every student is provided instruction at their level and really challenged to move to the next level with the ultimate goal, all students reading at proficient are, are advanced at I, the end of grade I really grade like three. the way you worked in that all of our teachers are proficient or advanced theme in there. That, that was a nice touch. Well, I have to tell you, having the consultant in the professional development is assuring that, um, you know, when you sit down with groups of parents, is my child benefiting from this? Is my child in a room that the professional development was given? Is my child in a room? And again, the consultant is working collaboratively, modeling lessons with teachers during the school year, um, working on Saturdays with teachers, and the response has been phenomenal. And then lastly, uh, to complete next year the $20,000 purchase so that these leveled readers in um, kindergarten through grade three, uh, every classroom, um, has the fiction and nonfiction. Again, the finance subcommittee, um, the you know, and the school committee, and the public pays attention to the references to making sure getting ready for park. You heard a reference from uh, the principal of the Tucker tonight that there's a list of 27 different genre that uh, will be asked on park, and so that could possibly be asked everything from a friendly letter to um, reading a historical novel. And we have to provide this type of literature in the classrooms if we expect our students to read um, the park, um, a historical paragraph, uh, biography, and then analyze that piece of writing. You have to have those types of genre in your classrooms. So the metrics that we measure as we go through in kindergarten and grade three of these formative classroom reading assignments, this was a purchase that, again, we were able to make with the advancement budget. Every teacher has been trained on how to administer the Fontes and Pinnell benchmark assessment, assessment system. For grades three through five, we purchased the Scholastic Reading Inventory. And at the kindergarten, uh, again, we'll have Ada Rose Marin and our kindergarten team in here. The work sampling that they're doing at the elementary, at the kindergarten level, is really um, unbelievable and providing uh, data and the formative data for report cards that's really going to drive the system. And then we are also looking at our grade three um, 2015 MCAS scores. That, again, bringing you back to my first slide, that's the first cohort that would have um, had uh, at least two years of reading specialists. Their teachers trained in uh, Reader's Writer's Workshop and benefited from the assessments and the fiction and nonfiction in their classrooms. And um, our anticipated outcome is that all students will read at grade level at the end of grade three, and again, working with a uh, CPI that we already know um, for the district and for the individual schools has been established. 
So our next initiative is closing the proficiency gaps pre-K to 12. Um, the research tells us um, that uh, from the roadmap to closing the proficiency gap, thank you. Experience tells us that, the, that there are consistent contributing factors that combine to produce underperformance. This advancement budget addresses four of these factors, and this is research that we have shared previously in presenting the advancement initiatives. We have lagging early literacy, not enough time in school, lack of effective analysis of data, and differences in educator effectiveness. And uh, through our um, proposal, we um, hope to address all of these um, factors. Identified needs at the elementary level. Um, there is a proficiency gap that exists between the high needs and non-high needs subgroup in both ELA and math. Also, um, we have identified um, that a gap exists between African American black and Hispanic Latino um, in ELA and math as compared to Asian and white subgroups. Um, and uh, we, we've noted that the high needs subgroup includes students with disabilities students identified as low income, and English language learners. Additional identified needs at the middle and high school levels. Um, a proficiency gap exists between all subgroups and their counterparts in ELA math and in science, technology, and en engineering. Those, those gaps exist um, in all of these content areas. So in um, fiscal year 14, um, the advancement um, budget, um, we, we did not have any new positions, but for instructional support, um, we had programs and instructional materials that supported our extended day and extended year learning opportunities. And uh, we identified these students through our, um, our internal assessments or through our MCAS data. Um, we um, purchased software for our elementary student assessment. Um, that was Study Island that we used at the elementary level. Um, that um, also provided us with opportunities for data collection and analysis. And then finally, we, um, um, we purchased student assessments that were implemented in ELA. And those were our um, assessments um, that uh, Superintendent Gormley mentioned. We had our Fountas and Pinnell assessments. We also had the um, scholastic reading inventory. Um, and again, all teachers were um, trained to administer those assessments. So preliminary results from the FY14 initiatives. Um, we had um, district-wide, um, district wide, we saw that the gaps in ELA and in science, technology, and engineering between African-American black students and white students decreased from um, 2013 to 2014. Um, we saw that, the, um, that it, at the middle school level, students in the high-needs subgroup um, increased um, by 11%. Um, uh, students uh, scored in the proficient or advanced categories in ELA. And at the high school level, 96% of students um, were proficient or advanced in ELA, 92% in math, and 88% in science. Um, so in the FY15 budget for this year, we had two new positions. Um, we had a, um, we hired a district-wide digital education administrator to support the integration of digital technology. The advancement budget also funded, um, is funding a data specialist to support data-driven instruction and to analyze student data and trends. And we are still working to hire a data specialist. Um, we um, have done some interviewing. We are continuing to advertise. We did um, work with a, um, a, a data specialist um, um, for a period of time to determine whether or not um, this um, person would be a good match 
and um, we found that she wasn't, although the data she provided was valuable to us. For instructional support, um, we, um, we had, um, we continued with extended day and extended year learning opportunities, and this was at all levels. And these opportunity, opportunities included the Summer Scholars Program at the Tucker School, um, the Pierce Academy, and the Calculus Project. Um, we also budgeted for ongoing professional devel development on addressing the proficiency gap. Um, we are continuing with um, um, our um, consultants for our readers and writers workshop. Um, and uh, also in the administration of our assessment tools. And uh, finally, um, we um, purchased materials to implement the writer's workshop at the elementary level. So our proposal for FY16 um, requests um, would be um, the following new positions. We have $60,000 proposed for an interim high school reading specialist. And this um, position would provide targeted assistance for students at risk um, according to um, performance in class and according to internal assessments as well as MCAS. Um, we're proposing $60,000 um, for another um, reading specialist at the intermediate level for grades four and five. Um, and uh, this position would also provide targeted assistance in the same way based on assessment data. For instructional support, we're proposing $25,000 um, <coughs> to support the calculus project. And this would continue the um, targeted summer pre-teaching sessions and school year tutorials to support those at-risk students who have been identified in grade seven. We're also proposing $20,000 to support the Pierce Academy. Um, again, targeted extended day instruction for students identified at risk. And uh, another $10,000 to support the high school bridge program. And um, that is additional targeted summer instruction for our rising ninth graders who are identified as at risk for not meeting proficiency. Additionally, um, for instructional support, we would um, propose $20,000 for the elementary extended day um, opportunities and extended school year opportunities. Um, again, all of these um, students would be identified through our assessment data. Um, we're proposing $20,000 for assessment software for the middle school and high school. And, um, our school um, leadership team is looking at software such as Edwin Teaching and Learning. Um, and this is um, an opportunity that was um, um, available to Race to the Top districts previously and um, will now be available to districts across Massachusetts. Uh, so we're looking at that. There is another assessment system known as Galileo. Um, and both of these systems would monitor uh, student performance. Um, Another proposal is for $10,000 for a summer PD institute on the proficiency gap. And this would be PD for, um, for teachers. Um, and uh, this would be um, this, the summer institutes um, could be on a variety of topics. But this, for example, this past year, we had summer institutes that continued um, support in uh, readers and writers workshop. And then finally, $8,000 for a new writing program at the middle school. And they are exploring um, different programs. Um, and we're proposing this $8,000 for text materials and um, for professional development. So metrics to measure progress and outcomes. Um, we will continue to, um, to look at district-wide formative assessments. Um, in um, English, math, and science, um, looking at the Fountas and Pinnell, continuing with scholastic reading inventory, um, common unit assessments, um, and the assessment system, whether it's Edwin Teaching and Learning or Galileo at the middle and high school. 
Um, we um, want to consider individual student success plans to um, measure progress and outcomes. Um, we will continue with our student data analysis meetings. Um, qu quarterly reviews of effectiveness of interventions and strategies. We're going to um, not only look at our internal assessments, we're also going to um, focus on the individual school um, CPIs for the different content areas. That is our plan this year as we um, have our data teams. Um, we're going to look at Study Island um, and our spring 2015 MCAS results. Anticipated outcomes. Um, we will consider um, all subgroups and hope that they will meet their DESE determined CPI targets um, and uh, look at individual students who participate in programs. The um, expectation is that they will achieve a student growth percentile of 50 or higher. For science and, and STEM, uh, again, to reiterate, science is an uh, integral part of the curriculum. At all levels, STEM is uh, a secondary initiative that it, uh, is more readiness related for uh, our graduates um, eventually. Uh, the research it has been unanimous in STEM for a number of years. Um, <coughs> as it reads, the National Research Council is recently as 2012 recognizes the important foundation um, and sets out three goals for US K-12 STEM education. One is to expand the number of students who ultimately pursue advanced degrees in STEM fields and broaden participation of women and minorities. And second is to extend the workforce uh, and broaden the participation of women and minorities. And to increase science literacy for all students. So there's the, uh, the two issues there. And it emphasizes, you know, the importance of the content and quality of the curriculum, the teacher's content knowledge, and the use of instructional practices that have been shown to improve outcomes. Again, identified needs. We chose some sections here where students have had limited access to our, or limited or no access to our current advancement initiatives. Um, you can see we've been consistent in grade five for the last, uh, couple of years in, in on the science tech uh, STE science technology engineering uh, exams in the MCAS um, similarly in grade 8 and uh, similarly in, in uh, biology biology has dipped in the last couple of years we've done better we've had uh, fewer students score below proficient um, some of these biology students have had the opportunity to, to uh, participate in some of the uh, materials we bought for the eighth grade so there, um, that was part of the, the original advancement initiative. So that group has had some experience with uh, our advancement materials. In fiscal 14, we expanded uh, an elementary science administrator. We had used to have one uh, administrator at all uh, K-12. K in fiscal 14, we added someone who was uh, de dedicated to elementary uh, science and STEM. We added the WeDo robotics materials and equipment for grade two STEM in the English Innovation Pathways. We added hands-on science materials and lab kits in grades six through eight um, for some of the middle school students. And we had professional development for the pe uh, Pierce teach, uh, Science teaching staff on those new materials. Um, preliminarily, uh, at the middle school where we spent a more of our uh, resources in the first year. The number of students with disabilities, for instance, who scored provision in advanced in STE uh, increased by 10 percent. At the elementary level, the number of grade five students who were in mourning was decreased by half. And in the high school, there were significant difference, uh, decreases in the CPI gaps uh, between low income and non low income, African American, black and white, and students with and without disabilities. So we saw some um, preliminary <clears throat> signs that we're going in the right direction with these. For this year, um, we added hands-on science kits and materials uh, in grades three through five. Um, we uh, had in 
added the creative computing program in the English Innovation Pathway in grade three. So that was to extend our STEM into grade three in the English, in the English program. And we had professional development again on the new science and STEM materials that we brought in. Looking to next year, um, we're looking at a point eight position in the middle school as a STEM technology teacher. What we want to be able to do is reorganize our electives uh, so that anyone who wants to take either a STEM or our, one of our iSTEM electives would be able to do so. The iSTEM is the Intensive Studies in Science, Techni Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. This is for students who have shown um, ability in these areas and want some enrichment. And so we've had the iSTEM program in uh, in the middle school, but it's been uh, restricted in the sense we've only had a few classes in it and um, it's it's really people have to apply to get into it as we heard last time from the science teachers at the last at our last meeting this would allow us to reorganize some of our technology electives and some of our um, other electives in order to uh, allow anyone who really wanted to take um, a stem elective the opportunity to do it um, in terms of instructional support, we would look for $25,000 in additional iSTEM materials. Um, that's actually, uh, such curriculum such as Project Lead the Way is one of the ones we're looking at. Um, we're also looking at $10,000 to purchase text equipment and additional supplies for the expansion of STEM into the uh, grade four in the English Innovation Pathway. We had done grade two and grade three in prior years. We want to roll this forward. Um, and $35,000 for elementary science materials for grades K-1 and 2. This is not STEM, this is science, this is for all children in grades K-1 and 2. You'll recall that we did some grade 3 and 4 materials in the previously, but um, had not done grade K-1 and 2. So this is to update materials um, to better align with the, the upcoming science curriculum frameworks. We're also looking at some high school science materials to the tune of $70,000. This is one we actually uh, originally proposed in um, Advancement 2.0 last year, but um, we had to put it off because of cost. Um, our biotech lab uh, needs uh, some updating. It was, uh, it is, even though we think of it as a new lab, several years old. Um, and we're looking, as uh, science uh, coordinators mentioned last time, towards becoming a, a PTC Academy School of Parametric Technology Corp, which is, uh, as, the, as they mentioned last time. And we want to uh, introduce more digital equipment to all the science classes. I mean, it, it seems strange to say that, but, you know, we, it isn't that long ago that equipment was all analog, where you had balances and things like that. and now. You know, no one uses a thermometer anymore. They're all digital probes and, and so forth. And so to, to really upgrade our equipment, um, we need to uh, analog uh, to bring more digital equipment in. This was one that um, Ed Mulvey had uh, recommended when he was here as our science department head. Uh, again, in professional development, uh, $20,000 for another sum summer PD Institute on science and STEM. Um, and uh, $10,000 to provide uh, targeted PD uh, to the elementary, uh, middle and high teachers in, in use of the various different kits and materials. Again, how are we gonna measure? Um, we have district-wide grade level assessments of students mastery at the end of science units in grades K through eight, now K through eight, because we'll be expanding to K one and two in science, and in STEM units in grades one through four, again, now adding grade four. And of course, we'll be looking at our, our <coughs> science MCAS scores. And our, our anticipated outcome is that we'll meet the um, CPI tar DESI CPI targets in fifth, eighth, and 10th grade um, in the spring 2016 exam, because that's when we, this will be in place. Um, in summary, uh, a chart of this is similar to the chart we had last year. If you put all this into one chart, um, you're looking at 3.3 uh, FTEs, 
a total of $556,000 um, in advancement initiatives. Um, what isn't on this chart, I realized on the way up here that we I hadn't put it in yet, is this year, as last year, there is a certain amount of, uh, of free cash and one-time money available. Approximately $293,000 of this 556 is one-time initiatives, and I'll update this chart so the next time you see it, it'll show it. But um, a significant portion of this, more than half, um, could actually be funded through one-time money from the town. So this is, as we say, this this is today's version. It's been undergoing flux for the last few weeks as it takes shape. This is again a preliminary proposal to the school committee to you know uh, for consideration. Uh, it's not for a vote tonight. We're scheduled just to present it so people can think about it um, with the idea of coming back and, and discussing it more at our, our next meeting. Thank you. Ms. Sheridan. Superintendent Gormley and your leadership team, I want to apologize for the fact that you began this presentation after 10 p.m. at night. This is so much work on your behalf. You know, so, much, so many hours of time went into this, and I think putting it at the end of a long meeting does not, is not respectful in my eyes. So I am sorry that I know we're under time constraints and we had no choice, but I just really feel that um, there's so much good work and research and information that's in here, and um, it just makes me sad that, that it's coming so late in the meeting. Having said that, I have lots of little questions that I'll address offline, but just in this last chart, I think it would be really helpful if we could have another row across above the total advancement that would give a total of every column just so that we could see what the total PD, what the total, you know, extended time, what the total technology. I mean, that one's easy. But um, I think that would be helpful. Thank you. There. So I have a couple questions. Just um, I think it's fantastic. I mean, all these things are really important and will bring us forward further. But um, I think a couple meetings ago I had mentioned it, but I'm just – wondering at what point do we also and I know this is an advancement budget so this might be somewhat different but I'm just really concerned at the increasing um, enrollment at the elementary schools and at what point especially at the larger schools we have to look at administrative increases in terms of vice principals for those schools what breaking point are we at I mean Collicott they said was 650 students Glover's about 560 Cunningham's up there, you know, Tucker's going up, and they're they're increasing every year. We haven't had a year where they've gone down. So I'm just wondering if that could be part of the discussion with your leadership team in terms of, especially with a new evaluation tool, what other school levels are, are we expecting too much from our leaders? At what point can they not handle any more? Even with adding these specialists, from what I understand, the evaluation tool can only be done by certain people, and I'm just concerned that they're overworked and I hate to lose really good people because we're taking too much from them you know with levels that are going up a hundred students in a couple of years it's just too much so that's just one thing I'd like to add to that conversation when we're talking about increasing positions or adding positions um, and then the other thing is this is just um, two little things this the the um, pre-k is there a space issue are we thinking about are we thinking of it really increasing the number of students and do we have the space for it? Or are we going to continue to use the same space that we're using well, now? We have a space issue in the district at the elementary. Yes, we do. Exactly. And so we're trying to hold on to the citizens and the parents of built these schools to have art and music mm -hmm. rooms and not art and music on a cart. Right. So right now we have a space at the Tucker and we deliberated with the team and we deliberated with the finance subcommittee um, I didn't even speak to uh, Elaine Germay um, about the model, but uh, we deliberated full time. We deliberated a model at each school, but we think that if it was five half days, we could um, increase the amount of services to the children mm -hmm. we're servicing, and we could double the number of children. Okay. And so um, this really is a multi-year, but we approach we do have a space <coughs> yeah I, I 
think so as well. At but the elementary As long school. as we have enough space for the, the pre-K program, that's great. And then just um, one little thing, and um, this is just something I know that you were there at this meeting too, um, Superintendent Gormley. I'm just the biotech lab and upgrading. There is money in the MFE budget that was raised that month. They raised that money originally to create the biotech lab. So, so it's a great question. Yeah. So you haven't seen an expenditure for that? They're going to use that money this year. Right. That's what year was that fundraiser? So they have, because we still have money in that account. It, but but yeah. what the wow. issue is, if you didn't have the MFE and you didn't have the PTOs, um, and this advancement budget has enabled us to impact all children, that MFE money has kept that biotech supplies yeah. Yeah. so that we didn't have to go uh, to the Milton Public School budget. That's you were at the meeting that I was at. That's the end of that money. Okay. So okay. that has been, that has been like um, a savings account for the biotech lab exactly. over the last years. The money is gone. Yeah, I think the teacher has done a great job at kind of preserving that. I mean, it's not that the money wasn't was forgotten about. He's just preserved it to keep equipment upgraded that need to be upgraded. But I just didn't know if if that wasn't somewhere on the table because I know they had brought it up that there's still some money so left in there that would be used. There's um, $9,000 left. I believe the purchase is, is it $70,000? Um, we sat down, they went over every one of the purchases that they want for that lab. Um, it, w it took my breath away how expensive high school science um, equipment is. Oh yeah, it's expensive. Uh, on that point, the, a lot of that equipment is so specialized it has to be maintained and tuned up every year whether you use it or not in order to keep it functional so the there is a an annual cost of maintaining that equipment that is you know far above the cost of maintaining most of our equipment you know it, it it's not like tuning up a violin it's yeah. it's a lot it's it's, it's a, a big money. expense to get some of that equipment um, and then mr Pavichek, what was the one-time money that you said what was it um that you how much of this approximately 293 i'll give you a Fine. Breakdown, but okay. questions. Say why they were interrupted. I'm sorry. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Oh, I'm positive. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, <laughs> annual report. It was mailed to all of us last Friday. Just take a look at it and please be prepared to it. Be, please be prepared to vote on it um, at our first December meeting. Yeah, yeah. And yep. if, if people would send in their edits, we'll incorporate all their edits Beforehand. and get it to you that Friday right. before. Yeah. Um, Ms. Padera, I'd like to move the MASC update to the next meeting. <sighs> yes. Second that. <laughs> I am and, so excited to tell you guys everything. And, and I'd like to hear don't. that. And, uh, order, I'm please. Just saying. Order, order. And Ms. Sheridan, I'd like to move yes. the facilities please. subcommittee review to the next meeting. <laughs> Great. Um, okay, I'll entertain a motion to go into executive add, session. Add one thing for your next oh, meeting. Yes, to black. Um, Special education action. subcommittee Excellent. at the next meeting just, on your agenda. To uh, well, it. let's talk about that. Thank you. I'm not sure we're ready for prime time there, but we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, I'll entertain a motion to go into executive session for the purpose of discussing contract negotiation negotiation strategy for non-union personnel. The discussion of which in public session would um, be detrimental to our negotiating position, not to return to public session. So moved. Second. Ms. Kelly. Yes. Ms. Bagley Jones. <laughs> no, no. Boy, <laughs> boy, if looks could kill, I'd be dead right now. <laughs> Mr. Zulus. Yes. Ms. Padero. Yes. Ms. Sheridan. I'd love to go. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are in executive session and not to return to public session.